Okay, seven o'clock. Let's get started. Um, all right, welcome everyone to the July 13th regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Um, Matt, our town manager, is standing in for our clerk today. Could we please have the roll call? I'd be happy to, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Valerie Devereaux. Here. Councilor Jeremy Gabrielson. Here. Councilor Jamie Garvin. Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Coming through loud and clear. Oh, well, I haven't gotten all loaded up here. Okay. Councilor Christopher Straw. Here. And Chairman Valerie Adams. Here. All right. Um, let us rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, and Matt will pull out that flag. <laughs> I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag United of States, the United States of America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, and for, justice all. for all. All right. Thank you. Um, and before we jump into the town council reports and correspondence, I know there has been interest and I'm trying to be better about noting this. We have 18 attendees from the public here today. Um, okay, town council reports and correspondence. Does anyone have anything to note at this point? No. Okay. Um, and then we shall move right along to the Finance Committee report. So I'll turn it over to Councillor Garvin for that. Thank you, uh, Chair Adams. Um, so one uh, month of reporting, uh, or we're not even one full month rather into reporting for, for the um, new calendar, new fiscal year. Um, but what you see in the dashboard tonight is through the year end um, fiscal 20. Um, so uh, the good news is, uh, as Matt had reported to us um, leading up to this month's meeting, um, all of the uh, uh, major revenues and, and key accounts that we watch all came in uh, on the plus side uh, with actuals to budget. So that was good. Um, there are a few that came in below forecast, but still um, uh, it, relative to the previous year, uh, but still uh, net positive to budget. So um, all in all, a good way to finish the fiscal year. Um, I want to thank the staff um, uh, that spent a lot of time and effort uh, in the last day of the month um, to get all the uh, accounts in order and uh, do all the fiscal year closeout. I know that that's a lot of work and uh, appreciate the effort and, um, and uh, time that was spent on all of that. Um, so now we move into the new fiscal year, fiscal 21. Um, so um, at next month's meeting, we'll, we'll see how the, the year's starting off. And I think it'll be really important um, as we're going forward in the first half of the year and as we approach the fall um, uh, 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 tax deadline uh, in October to see how, how we're doing on the revenue side. Um, uh, relative to the projections that we have in the fiscal 21 forecast. So uh, are there any questions? Matt, anything you wanted to add? Thank you, Councilor Garvin. Uh, yes, you, you, you encapsulated exactly what I was uh, looking at. The big, the big items, obviously, our excise was a, was a concern coming into the, well, going through the pandemic and the fact that we did uh, exceed by 2.3% uh, was a very uh, strong finish and that is by, uh, by no small Herculean task or effort by our tax collector staff. They did a great job working that through and they did ultimately about three months worth of uh, work in a one month period of time uh, to book that and they're extremely proud of that. And then the others, uh, the one that we do have on our sewer fees, uh, we will book that. Uh, th those numbers come in later in the month so those will go back to uh, this year. So we should exceed uh, what we anticipated as well. It's just a question of the reporting from 
uh, Portland Water District that we should uh, that we are going to be receiving that, and then ultimately uh, building permits as well as revenue sharing are two uh, major uh, developments over the course of the year where we uh, exceeded on revenue sharing by 12 and a half percent, and then building permits by 47 percent, almost 40 uh, 47 percent, which was uh, just amazing when you think about all the uh, trials that we went through this spring. Uh, the fact that the the trades were still uh, churning along and uh, getting that work done has been uh, captured there. So that's been a that's been a good thing. We are looking forward to a. Uh, they're starting with the audit work right now, pre-audit with RKO. So that is underway uh, on both the school and the uh, business office side here. So uh, we'll be ready uh, for that as well as we enter into the next fiscal year. Great. So if no questions, I have nothing further. All right. Um, thank you, Matt and Jamie. Um, we do now have 25 attendees. This is the point when we open for um, citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the, the agenda. So if anyone here in attendance wishes to comment on something not on this evening's agenda, you can use the raise hand function of the Zoom meeting and you will be recognized and given the opportunity to speak. Um, we do ask that you limit your comments to about three minutes and identify yourself by name and address. Seeing no one, uh, we'll move on to the town manager's report, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be uh, brief this evening. I just want to uh, uh, start off by uh, letting folks know that tomorrow the tax collector's office will be closed during the day. Uh, that is uh, primarily due because all of our staff is will be across the street helping with the election. And uh, uh, so they'll be working on that and trying to get our results uh, turned into one day. Uh, that's a Herculean task. It, it seems to be the, the phrase of the day today uh, because uh, voting day is tomorrow, but we have currently over 3000 absentee ballots that are being processed by staff. Uh, they worked all weekend, all day today, and they will be through the day and into the evening tomorrow trying to put uh, all of those ballots uh, through the machine and, uh, and into our voting machine so we can get those results uh, moving forward. That is an amazing amount of uh, work. And I'd also take a moment to extend our gratitude to the citizens of the town, one for their civic conscience to uh, to take the, the right to vote uh, literally and, uh, and exercising their right, which we are happy about as well as following our uh, requests and the requests from the state to try to pursue the absentee uh, approach because uh, it's been very, it's a good safe way for folks to, to get their vote in. And uh, 3000 is a huge number for a June, for a June election as well. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, but we are working really hard to get those, get those get those votes tallied. Uh, also, uh, Maureen and the Conservation Committee have asked that I remind folks that uh, residents are being asked to provide names for local unnamed water bodies. And there is a survey on the town's website. Uh, they really want your help. Uh, there are surprisingly a, a good number of unnamed water bodies that, uh, that, would, that would like to be named. So there is a survey there online. You can hit that on the town's website through the Conservation Committee's uh, link. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity to thank all of our staff to get us through to the year end. It's, uh, it's been a challenge uh, and a half uh, in, in across multiple departments and the fact and how hard they have worked to get us to where we are today uh, and ready to close out one fiscal year and begin another uh, has been a great amount of work for them to do. And uh, oh yeah, one other thing looking back at um, looking back at the absentee ballot process, I want to take the time to thank the public again there for for following our protocols and being really positive when it came to that and working well with staff and following the, uh, the way that we had it lined up. That seemed to have gone very well and we received a couple of different emails uh, thanking Deborah and her staff for their hard work on getting that through and getting folks in and voting safely, securely. And uh, to that effort, uh, I did apply for some Keep Maine Healthy uh, funds to help offset uh, some of the expenses that we have received. That was, uh, you might have seen it early, uh, it was a program from the, I think the first or second round of stimulus that was provided to the states. This was a program that the governor and her office has created to help offset uh, 
the expenses that we do encounter for running the elections safely and cleanly, as well as uh, some of our efforts to help uh, spread the word as far as uh, the best practices to help battle this uh, pandemic. And uh, we did receive a $36,000 uh, amount of funds from the key main healthy uh, funding. So uh, as soon as I find out about these opportunities, I, uh, we're jumping on them. We had our ducks ready uh, and lined up to be ready to go on that. So we did receive that and I'll be working with the state to, uh, to track those funds and make sure that we provide all of our accounting, but uh, we are working that forward. So uh, that's all I have to, to report on this evening, Madam Chair, thank you. Right. Thank you, Matt. Um, okay, so we do have three sets of minutes to approve at this meeting. Those are from the June 8th, 2020 meeting and the June 15th and June 22nd special meetings. Um, we could do these all together unless someone wants to pull one out. So I'm looking for a motion to approve those draft minutes. Move that we approve the minutes as a set. Uh, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Matt? Councillor Valerie Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Jeremy Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Jamie Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Christopher Straw? Yes. Chairman Valerie Adams. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number 94-2020, Good Table Liquor License Renewal. Um, and I'll note that at this point, we do have 28 attendees. There's an opportunity now for any public comment on this item. Um, please use the raise hand function of the Zoom meeting if you would like to comment. Uh, oh. Caitlin, did you? I, I don't see any um, attendees raising hands. So, um, Caitlin, go ahead and Penny. Uh, I just have to disclose that my family business does business with the good table. Thank you. I also uh, need to disclose that uh, the good table um, is a strong supporter of Cape Farm Alliance, which I'm a member of, and a supporter of farms. Uh, in Kick Elizabeth. I ditto that one too. Thank you. Um, any, any issues that any counselor would like to raise with regard to their participation? Seeing no one. Okay. Um, so just briefly, the good table located at 527 Ocean House Road is seeking renewal, renewal of their Malt, liquor, wine, and spirits licenses. No concerns have been reported. Um, do I have a motion? Um, Penny? Um, I will uh, move that we uh, approve the uh, renewal of the um, malt, liquor, and wine and spirits license for the good table at, on Ocean House Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, Jamie, I saw your hand up. Is that a second? Sure thing. Okay. Uh, any discussion on this item? Seeing none. Um, all in favor? Matt? Councillor Valerie Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Jeremy Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Jamie Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Christopher Straw? Yes. Chairman Valerie Adams? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's unanimous. Thank you. Um, all right, moving right along to item number 95 2020, the short term rental ordinance amendments. Um, anyone wishing to comment on this item from the public may now raise their hand. I do see one popping up. So I'll just remind attendees, please do try to limit your comments to three minutes per person and identify yourself by name and address for the record. Um, so the way this works is that when you raise your hand, 
I will recognize you, Matt will give you permission to speak, but just as a blanket reminder or news for everyone, you may need to unmute yourself before you can actually talk. So uh, it looks like uh, Doug Dransfield is the first one with a hand up and talking is permitted. So you can go ahead, Mr. Dransfield. Thank you. This is Douglas Dransfield. I live at 48 Richmond Terrace here in the Cape. Um, thank you for this opportunity to comment tonight. I want to comment on the amendments. They now allow for a primary residence to be rented for a total of 105 days per year. That's in section 19-8-14, short-term rental standards, section B, permitted short-term rentals, two primary residence unhosted. And then in section C of the standards, three, minimum length of stay, the minimum length of stay is set at seven days. And these two combined mean that the property could be occupied as many as 15 times per calendar year. In my experience, the disruption to a neighborhood by short-term rental activity is linked to the number of times unknown persons are in the neighborhood. The longer the period, the longer the period guests are in residence, the more the guests seem to make themselves known and attempt to be good neighbors for their stay. It has seemed that the shorter the length of stay, the more likely the property is being used for a party-like gathering and less as a family vacation home. Allowing a property to change tenants 15 times in one year is too much. And it's too much disruption to a residential neighborhood such as mine, even if only one of the houses on my private road is rented. But if you multiply that even two or three times more, it's very excessive. Would you please consider in addition to the total days and minimum length of stay limits, a limit to the number of times per year a property can be rented. I would suggest that number be four times a year. They would still allow 105 days of rental income, but would mean the rental would be for three rentals of 30 days and one rental of seven days, for instance. If a homeowner is wanting to rent the property for as much as 105 days per year, the continuous rental for 30 days should not be a problem. Adding this restriction on the maximum number of rentals per year should be enforceable using Hamari. Hope I pronounced that right. A number of times limit would be a compromise that allows the rental income of 105 day limit while also decreasing the impact of the length of time to the neighbors remaining in their homes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next individual with the hand raised is identified as Penny. Um, Penny, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Talking is permitted. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I just have to get my... Uh, just give me a minute here. It's hard for me to navigate. Um, yes, my name is Penny Pollard. I live here in Cape Elizabeth in Peebles Cove. Um, it is today and it has been my position that the problem that exists in Cape Elizabeth um, with short-term rentals is a very minor one uh, that is represented by a few properties. Um, and I don't believe that the problem that exists requires the drastic ordinance changes that are drafted here, which will hurt residents in the town who have been for years, in some cases for generations, carefully carrying on in a manner respectful of their neighbors and the town in receiving visitors in their homes without offense. That is the majority of those of us who rent short term, not the minority who may be offensive. Uh, the problem that does exist is that there are a few problem owners who do not follow the current ordinance. They cause disturbance to their neighbors and generally disregard the culture of their neighborhoods in the town. My rental house is not next door to my house, but it is one house over. I would be eliminated from being able to use my property. I can see my rental house, the comings and goings, when there are lights on in the house, when someone is parked there. I monitor fully what goes on in my house. My tenants, and in fact, anyone who rents in Peebles Cove neighborhood, signs a rental addendum, which carefully describes what is and is not allowed in the town and in the neighborhood. 
something as simple as, of, as this has worked beautifully to establish a good tenant compliance and good neighbor compliance. And I know the town permit requires this, but we actually require filing the signed addenda with the secretary of our neighborhood association. So compliance with such a system at the town level would go a very long way in reducing few concerns that are expressed by uh, residents about the few properties in town that are repeat offenders. That's what we're dealing with, a small number of properties who are repeat offenders. Relative to those few are the majority of homeowners who rent who are good citizens of this town, respect the rules, respect the ordinance, and I believe that you're punishing us when it is by your own statements of very few who have caused offense. Please reconsider how you characterize the properties that may continue to offer short-term rentals by, I don't know, be creative. I set an appeals process at one point, but the town manager and the town planner said that there is no such thing as an appeals process with an ordinance. But, you know, there are those of us who are rule following currently permitted rental homeowners, and we'd like to continue to offer our homes for rent. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, anyone else from the public wishing to comment on this item? Uh, yes, uh, um, Sandra Dunham. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I, I agree with Penny in that the majority of the renters, rentals, properties are not a problem. Um, and and I, um, we've been renting our cottage next to our house now for about 13 years. We've never had an issue, never had a problem. We screen our people carefully. We, we don't have people sign something, but we have a lot of restrictions on, you know, no parties and it's, it, we get mostly um, families. And um, I, I, I think that I, I do agree with Penny that um, there are a number of people as her who won't be able to rent their property if they you have these stringent rules in there. And um, I did write a letter um, and one of my questions, what we fit, we fit into the property that's adjacent, renting a property that's adjacent to our house. And um, the, uh, one of the things it says is the owner must be at home. Uh, when it's rented, we're not always at home or we may be gone for the day. Um, and some of the other categories don't have that requirement. I, I think you could achieve what you're probably looking for is because the owner could be available by phone. Um, the, I think it's unrealistic if you're going to, as the first gentleman said, require 30 day rentals. That's unrealistic because people don't, the majority of people do not come to Maine for 30 days at a time. They come for a week or maybe two weeks at a time. Um, so it, it, I think that's an unreasonable uh, request, particularly since the majority of the uh, rentals are, don't cause a problem. Um, I have a couple of other questions. Um, one is about the termination of all existing permits by the end of December. What does that mean? And I just, noticed um, that your, it says rental permit on uh, $250 effective immediately and $500 at the first of the year. Currently it's $50. And I, I just wondered why you're raising it um, so much. Um, and uh, what about people who have already paid their fee? And most people, we canceled all of our people for this year, our renters, because of the virus. So we're not even getting renters. And um, so I was wondering how you arrived at that fee. And is this going to be sent to the planning board? Anybody have a, any comments or answers to my questions? So, Ms. Dunham, um, before we go further, do you mind just giving your address for the? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Our uh, 11 Becky's Cove Lane. Thank Cable you. Is 
Um, and then we we don't typically do a um, back and we'll forth during okay. this time, but I did make a note of your questions and we'll, okay. we'll get great. to that. Someone could get to me, that, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for your work on this. Okay, um, any other public comment on this item? And just to clarify that with the one question before we get deeper into this was about the action um, this evening and it would be to forward these recommendations to the planning board. That would be the action that the council would take um, if that motion is made and subsequently approved. Um, all right, that's an individual identified as MTH. I am Michael Howard, 15 Rocky Point Lane, Cape Elizabeth, a year-round resident. I just want to address some, uh, some of the points that were raised um, regarding the majority of rentals being, being non-problematic versus the minority, which are the problems. Uh, in my, that is not the experience that I've had. Um, our experience is that the majority of the problems, the majority of the short-term rentals in our neighborhood are a problem. Uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the fees, uh, my expect, I'm, I was actually surprised that the fees are so low given the costs um, that the code enforcement officer and that the police department have had in addressing short-term rentals just in our neighborhood. Uh, and uh, based on my experience, I would support the proposed legislation as currently written. That's it. Thank you. All right, any other um, comment before we close the public comment period? Seeing no one, all right. We shall move on, okay. Um, so, as we all know, um, we have some recommendations that were included in the materials for amendments to the short-term rental ordinance. And I am looking for a motion to forward those recommendations to the planning board um, for review. I would note before we get into this item that we did workshop it pretty thoroughly previously. If counselors feel that further workshopping is needed, um, Matt had noted that we may need to have a brief meeting later this month on some other items and we could have another brief workshop if that seems necessary. So I just wanted to throw that out there before we get into it, but looking for a motion first. I see no motion to forward these to the planning board. Um, okay, uh, Jamie and Valerie D both had hands up at the same time. So I saw Valerie's first. I think, so. the, I think the raise hand function moved. I was trying to find it, but anyway, um, I move that we forward the recommendations to the planning board. Okay. I'll second. I'll okay. second. All right. Um, discussion. Uh, yes, Chris. Uh, can uh, we get a quick background about uh, how this draft uh, memo came into being? So the draft was based upon our discussion at the um, workshop and Maureen went through based on our, our comments and added in what she identified as the changes that we were seeking. Um, I've already identified a few points where I think maybe there were there was not consensus. Um, so did you have something further to say, Chris? Yeah, specifically not the, the uh, text, but the draft memorandum. And to be even more particular, the draft memorandum is proposing that we revise the comprehensive plan in order to allow this proposed draft of the ordinance, which I find hilarious because I've continuously noted throughout this entire process that the current draft ordinance, in my opinion, uh, directly contradicts the comprehensive plan, is not in basic harmony with the comprehensive plan, and in no way uh, meets our goals that are set out for the various residential districts as set forth in the comprehensive plan. So I think it's curious that we're suddenly sending this through to the planning board without any discussion about the fact that suddenly 
to my knowledge, we've never mentioned that we're going to be revising the comprehensive plan in order to allow these ordinance changes to go through. So I'm wondering, how did this get in the, the how did this memorandum come into being? Because I don't remember us talking about this, and we're about to just send this through to the planning board without any discussion whatsoever. So I want some background, and I'm not happy. Okay, and I just wanted to say, um, to clarify that I, I didn't mean with regard to my comment that um, Maureen had aired because I wanted to thank her for her work on drafting that, but just that Maureen and I had discussed that there were things that there had not been consensus on um, once we got to drafting. Okay, so Chris. So we're proposing opening up the comp plan. Is that, is that what's going on? Because that's what this draft memo says. And I, I apologize for being a little persnickety and uh, vinegary right now, but it, it's like this, I voted against the comp plan because I said this, this thing's flawed and it needs to be revised. The rest of you voted for it. I've been continuously harping on the fact that these ordinance revisions are not in compliance with the comp plan. And now we're suddenly proposing we're reopening the comp plan in order to allow these changes to go through. So, and again, I apologize for being short tempered on this, but I, I'm not happy with it. Um, Matt, did you want to respond with regard to the, the actual memo itself? Yeah, I do you one better on that, Madam Chair? I have Maureen and I can promote her to be a panelist and she can, uh, I think she can provide answers to uh, Councilor Straw's questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Just take me a moment to, to do that. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Maureen. So, uh, Councilor Straw, again, with deepest respect, um, I think that what is before you is a whole order of magnitude uh, smaller than what you had, a, what you are discussing in terms of a comprehensive plan uh, change. Uh, as the planner, I'm always looking at what uh, the town is looking to adopt and thinking about trying to get the town in the best legal uh, position. And that memo in front of you gives you the exact recommendation in the comp plan regarding short-term rentals. And it says to do almost nothing. And you're actually changing the structure of how you're regulating short-term rentals. And so it, it seems to, if you're gonna move ahead with this draft, assuming this is what you eventually adopt, the, the recommendation in the comp plan says to do nothing but change the, change the number of people who get permits. And I think what the recommendation in the comp plan should really say is something along the lines of um, focusing predominantly on primary residency as the type of short-term rental, as well as making sure that everyone gets a permit. So in order to try to get you in the best legally defensible position, I would suggest that you take recommendation, I think it's number 86, and you ask the planning board to revise it. And it would have to go to a public hearing just like the amendments would, then it would be brought to the council and you would hold a public hearing on this amendment just as you would as the, you, you would have the amendments to the ordinance. And I would say that this is unusual, but not completely unique. Uh, when, the pl when the town adopted its first telecommunication regulations, um, there was no comment on telecommunications in the comp plan at that time. And so you adopted an amendment to the comp plan to um, align with your regulations. So that's why that is there to give the planning board direction to uh, also clean up that recommendation in the comp plan. Um, yes, Chris, go ahead. Uh, uh, so I, I appreciate that explanation. Uh, I nevertheless um, think this definitely should have been highlighted for all of us rather than being buried in a memo. Um, obviously, um, it, it just wasn't, um, and it's just my personal opinion. I think this is a major uh, change of direction. The, the fact that this comp plan was passed uh, just a year ago, in my understanding of the way that, and it, this goes, I guess my frustration is rooted in the fact that this has been the problem that I've had with this town for the last 10, 15 years. There is a process, my understanding is there's a way that all of this is supposed to play out. You as a town are supposed to put together the comp plan and then we implement it by way of these ordinances. And it's almost like 
it, it basically we were supposed to bind ourselves ahead of time and then follow the guidelines. The comp plan is like a menu and it gives us options to choose from. It's like we can choose pepperoni pizza or a, or a mushroom pizza or a sausage pizza or a cheese pizza. Uh, and it gives us those options. It doesn't say which, op, which pizza you're gonna choose. You, you get to choose between them so long as you're choosing a pizza. You don't get to order a porterhouse steak. And what we're doing here is we basically said, hey, we want to do something that is not in compliance with the comp plan. So rather than stay in compliance with the comp plan, which is my understanding of the way this process is supposed to work, is we're just saying, oh, whatever comp plan, we'll just change you to make you do what we want you to do uh, because we want our ordinance to be a particular way, which is not the way this process is supposed to work. And I feel like in my frustrations, because I feel like this has happened continuously over and over and over and over for the last decade in this town. And it's on us, the town council, that we choose to proceed in this way. Um, it, and I'm just frustrated by it. I, I don't agree with this approach. Um, and I would say that this doesn't fix the problems. As I've continuously noted through this debate uh, for the last couple months, um, these changes, in my opinion, are in no way uh, in basic harmony with the comp plan. Even this will not make these changes in basic harmony with the comp plan. I keep asking, how are these changes in any way implementing peaceful and quiet enjoyment of residential neighborhoods as required under the comp plan in my interpretation? And it, it falls on deaf ears. There's no response given. And it, it's my belief it's because there is no response. And so this change, you might say, oh, this will immunize us somehow. But I still look at it and I don't know of any ordinance that's ever been struck down in the state of Maine because of its uh, uh, direct contradiction with the comp plan. Um, but I'd be really curious to see what happens with this one. It, maybe it flies through, but it just, I look at this and, and I do not see how we reconcile these changes with the requirements of the comp plan. I don't see how it's in basic harmony. I don't see how this implements peaceful and quiet enjoyment. I've asked over and over throughout this process and no one has given me an answer. And it's because there is no answer as far as I can tell. And I look forward to one of you demonstrating and showing me that I'm wrong, but no one has done it as of yet. And this change won't fix it. We still have the same basic problem. Jamie? Um, I, I, just in response, Chris, I, I understand your frustration. I think what, what, um, what your position though, for me, uh, what it suggests though is that there's virtually no circumstance sort of on the ground in real time that um, could cause any council to make a decision uh, that it, it is in somehow even even partially inconsistent in your view with the with the comprehensive plan. So, you know, comprehensive plans are done every 10, 12, 15 years, right? So, it, what you're what you're saying suggests that if if there were ever anything uh, within that period um, that is inconsistent with <clears throat> with that plan then the council can't take action on it in a way that they feel is necessary to respond to a situation um, that, that presents itself. Um, so number one, that's why the mechanism to make an amendment to the comprehensive plan exists. N number two, I'd say that there are um, portions throughout the comprehensive plan, and, and, and this was known through its development and our review and approval of it, that are um, by their nature, somewhat contradictory to each other, right? So there are places within the housing section uh, for which I think that this falls completely consistent. Uh, you know, the, the, the recommended changes fall completely consistent with that. Um, so I, I think, I think it, it all depends on which portions of this action you're looking at and how you're view through what lens you're viewing them to, to make you know, your own judgment around how consistent or inconsistent they may be with that plan. But moreover, like I said, in the big picture, um, you know, the plan is not something that is um, etched in stone in a way that it's, it's impossible to deviate from it. Should there be, a, you know, an agreed need to do so. And I, I think, um, you know, I, I don't have any problem with the direction we're headed with this. Um, on that basis, and um, you know, think it's think it's necessary. So, um, Penny, I want to respond to uh, Chris's um, comments also, and I 
understand uh, where you're coming from relative to how this um, might fit with aspects of the um, the comprehensive plan that addresses uh, neighborhoods and um, uh, et cetera. But there's also aspects, and this is where, um, as I look at the, the comp plan, we look at it from an integrated perspective, because there are also aspects of the comp plan that I do talk about us wanting to uh, help people stay in their homes, to help people um, uh, uh, retain their, their, their properties. And um, this is a mechanism that uh, helps and allows them to do this. So it's uh, aspects of the comp plan do bump up against each other. And so it's the uh, integrated approach from my perspective that we, uh, that we need to take. Um, so, and I agree with Jamie on the fact that um, with any plan that's a uh, three year, five year or 10 year plan, uh, the world uh, kind of ebbs and flows and you need to respond to that accordingly. Jeremy. Um, yeah, thank you, Valerie. Um, yeah, and I just to add on to that a little bit more, um, and not trying to pile on here, but um, I would um, I would note um, with regard to your comment about the frustration with the council seeking to uh, uh, amend the the comp plan. This is very much in line with the type of of comp plan amendments that I've seen in numerous other communities around the state for areas where there is sort of an evolution in practice. Um, Maureen noted the example of communication towers earlier. Uh, there was also a flurry of, of comp plan amendments, I would say probably about 10, 15 years ago when people started build, building small scale wind and most comp plans in the state didn't, simply didn't address that. Um, and I, I think, so I, I, I don't have a problem with forwarding this, I, I would have liked to have seen it sooner as well, but um, I think it's very much in line with, with uh, practice throughout the state. Uh, I also um, just would note, in terms of the whether or not this is in line with peaceful and quiet enjoyment of neighborhoods, the standards there are a little vaguer. Um, and I think it would be, as much as I would prefer to see a stricter ordinance um, with regard to how we'd be regulating short-term rentals, um, I think it would be fair to note that reasonable people can reasonably disagree as to whether or not this ordinance promotes that. In fact, we've had substantial public comment from, from folks, some of whom have spoken tonight, uh, to the effect that, you know, this ordinance unduly restricts what they see as peaceful and quiet enjoyment of their, of their property. So I, I understand your frustration with that, and I, I share the direction you're going, but I I don't know that I agree that, that this ordinance is, is necessarily on the face of it inconsistent with that provision of the comp plan. Um, that said, I also just had a, a, a sort of a procedural question. Um, the council has received a number of comments in the last few days about the number of days or the rental limits um, and some ideas such as the one that Mr. Gramsfeld brought up earlier about limiting the number of rentals. Uh, and so my, my procedural question, I, I, I think that personally my, my view is that the, the number of rental days that we've hit on is, is high, higher than I would otherwise like it to be. Um, and so if we forward this to the, um, to the planning board tonight, um, what is the process if we then subsequent, if we come, if it come, they come back and say we like this ordinance. What's our process if we are making a change to the number of days, or can we phrase our question to the planning board in a way that allows them to sort of to ask them um, a, a broader opinion than just a thumbs up, thumbs down? Um, so I'll, I'll, I, I just that yeah, that's my question. Annie, did you want to reply to that, or were you raising your hand with another? 
I wanted to reply to that kind of add um, add on. I I I think that what we send to the planning board needs to be what we want them to uh, review um, and they do the public hearing and then it comes back and we then, um, I don't want to rework it at that point. I want to rework it before it goes to the planning board. And so, um, because I agree with uh, Jeremy, we've had um, uh, comments and I think some of the uh, input around the uh, durations. I personally uh, would prefer having a, um, a quick uh, workshop to discuss items that we may have seen um, all pulled together for the first time and then prepare it to move to the planning board. I want to send a package that we are in support of. Um, Valerie D. I, I agree. I think it's a good idea if we do a workshop. We've had a lot of people contacting us about the uh, number of days and I'd, I'd like it to be um, really clear what we're sending to the planning board, really clear, our ideas very clear. And um, just to touch on um, what we were talking about uh, with the comp plan, revising it, I too agree that um, comp plans are, are not set in stone. They're basically a living document. Just like our town is alive and constantly changing, so is the comp plan. And that's why we have amendments. And I see no problem with um, amending our comp plan to reflect the changes that are going on in our town. So, um, and I would agree with uh, the workshop. I think Matt said that we could workshop this next week. Is that right, Matt? Yes, if, if, if that's uh, what the council would like to do, we can set a, uh, set a meeting for next week and then have a workshop subsequent to that. Uh, if that was, is the council's desire, we can, we can get that done, Council Devereaux. Yeah, and I, I imagine no one is super excited about adding another meeting, um, but Matt had also noted that there were a couple items that would necessitate a brief meeting regardless. So we had talked about tacking it on next week. Um, um i don't I, I i guess i don't have any objection to going to a workshop um I, I still think we have so much you know so much uh ahead of us before we get to final on this but if, if we need to have another workshop that's fine um i wanted to because they hadn't been answered yet uh, address a couple of the questions that came up from the public um in the comment period which um uh, addressing Ms. dunham's questions um, I, specific to your question about in residence, I, and I think there's another, um, uh, example, uh, or property type description, uh, for hosted that uses the same language. Um, I read that to be in residence, just like I'm in residence and I'm not a short term rental operator. It means that I, you know, this is my home. I come to it most evenings and wake up in it most mornings and things like that. It, I don't think the definition of in residence, and maybe we need to add some language to specify, I'm fine with that. But I don't think the definition of in residence here was to imply that you were physically on site 24 seven. And I, 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 don't, I don't think anybody else on the ordinance committee had intended for that to be the case either. The examples that you gave us in your comments here tonight and in the email that you sent to the council of you know being out for work or running errands or any part of your daily life are all consistent with, I think, the idea that you are still there um, as the property owner. Um, the other question you had, I think, was around fees. Um, and largely, uh, and, and, you know, we, we can debate whether or not the purpose of the fee should be a revenue generator, whether the purpose of the fee should be some barrier to entry. Um, but in the, in the ordinance committee's discussion, the major discussion about the increased fees was around um, making it expense neutral uh, for the addition of the third party uh, compliance and monitoring um, partner that we would look to engage with. So they, they based their, their costs off of the number of properties 
Uh, so on a per property basis, the fee should be high enough such that it, um, it makes that expense neutral at a minimum. So um, that's well north of the $50 it is today. Um, so that's how we arrived at that fee. Um, you know, I think one of the things, you know, a lot of, a lot of feedback was sent as others have alluded to by email um, that I wanted to just address a little bit in my comments too. Um, the first of which is to thank people for their continued engagement and thank them for, um, you know, uh, continuing to be an invested part of this process. Um, I continue to say that, you know, as, as difficult as this work has been, it has also, I think, been very productive in the way that it has brought people together with differing points of view and um, all of us with a, I, I think, a mutual objective of compromise towards finding something that works for um, as many, um, you know, as many people as possible. I, I continue to be impressed by uh, the way people have approached us with their comments in that regard. Um, the one thing that is I'm seeing though is a consistent sort of thing across all of the comments is that um, at this point there's a lot of granular dissection of individual pieces of the ordinance and recommendation that pulled out and standing on their own um, may look or be interpreted one way as either going too far or not going far enough to address a, a particular concern. And sort of similar to what Penny was saying earlier about how the comprehensive plan needs to be taken as a whole, I would encourage everybody to both, you know, the public as well as the council as we continue to review this, to look at the recommendation as a whole and how each one of these things sort of interrelates to the other. Um, and most notably, um, the requirement that um, for an unhosted stay, uh, the property would have to be somebody's primary residence, that that has to be proven and validated, um, that um, they're attesting to that uh, is subject to um, uh, felony uh, in, in so much that it would be uh, in violation of state statute if it were proven to not be their primary residence. Um, and that in making it the primary residence, um, that in and of itself, I think, is going to dramatically reduce the amount of stay nights or weeks, whatever, you know, whatever we call it, um, that somebody will be actually um, making their property available. There are, there are far fewer people than exist I think far fewer properties than exist today where we, we don't have that primary residency requirement where um, somebody is actually going to be out of the property for 105 days. Um, so we can, we can lower that ceiling if we feel like it's necessary. But I, I, what my point that I'm trying to make though is that I, I think the, the establishment of the primary residency requirement as a threshold is, is going to have a dramatic effect on reducing the amount of overall short-term rental stays in Cape Elizabeth. Um, so anyway, as, as, we, as we continue to discuss this, continue to work through it, I, I think that all of, all of the ordinance needs to be taken as its whole and, and not completely individually dissected part by part because I think that that disregards the purpose of the entire action. Thank you. Um, okay. So we do have a motion on the table. Um, there has been some discussion of workshopping this a little bit further. Um, I think unless someone is prepared to amend or withdraw that motion, we should just, uh, yes, Jamie. Um, I'm happy to withdraw the motion. Um, I did forget one other thing that I specifically wanted to respond to from emails that we've received too. Um, we had a couple of emails from um, a couple of folks who've been very invested in this process and been um, uh, you know, outspoken with their views, which have been appreciated. Um, and I, I, I wanted to note in particular a comment that I read in, in multiple emails though um, about a previous meeting that we held on this topic where um, it was heard by these people as, as they replayed their, you know, their, their recollection of the meeting back to us um, that one or more counselors in referring to the, the number of days um, 
uh, said that they quote unquote don't care. Um, and I, I don't, I honestly don't remember that very well might have been me that said that I, I the, the point I'm bringing it up is, is to number one, apologize if that's what, what they heard, or that's what one of us said, because it was, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure not the, not the point that anybody here on the council uh, would want wanted to convey that we don't care about this. And I, I would say that the number of meetings that the ordinance committee sat through uh, working on this, on this particular topic, as well as other counselors have, have put in their time and energy on, I think is testament to the fact that we all do care very much about this. The fact that we're going to, you know, sounds like have another workshop on it um, is, is further testament to that. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, through having these Zoom meetings, sometimes either a point isn't made clearly or some of our meetings have been running long and maybe fatigue had set in, I don't know. I apologize uh, you know, to those folks who heard those comments that way. Uh, and like I said, I, I really don't think that that was the intent um, of either myself or anyone on the council. And like I said, I don't even know if I'm the one that said it, but um, in any case, um, we do care very much about this. That's why we're still working on it. So I just wanted to say that with that, I'll withdraw the motion. Thank you. Um, Chris, go ahead. I just wanted to note the comp plan explicitly states under commercial activities in residential areas, quote, the first choice for locating commercial activities should be a business district. However, the town will continue to allow low impact commercial activities that do not substantially decrease the peaceful, quiet, and enjoyment of residential neighborhoods. I continue to put forward the point that based on the acrimony, based on the issues that we've had, short-term rentals decrease the peaceful, quiet enjoyment of residential neighborhoods, and they do so substantially. Jamie makes a good point that most of the complaints that we get are from unhosted rentals, but we cannot assure that hosted rentals will not also be an issue in the long run. My approach to, short, to zoning is you zone based on what you want in the future, not as a reaction to uh, the problems that are arising at this moment in time. And I think that's at the core of the, 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 uh, the dispute that, um, and the different opinions that we have on, on the council. My approach is uh, you zone for the future um, and some of the rest of you seem to instead take the approach of, but we don't wanna overly restrict and we're just going to deal with the issues that have arisen at this point in time. My cons the reason why I think my approach is better is because if you allow something to go in now and then we discover it is an issue, you then have people coming in and saying, I just spent all of this money buying this house in order to engage in this activity. And now you're saying, I can't do it. I've already sunk all of this money into it. Or I just remodeled half of my house so that I could have people uh, renting it. And now you're telling me I can't do this activity. I've already sunk $100,000, $200,000 into it. It's not fair to change the rules at this point in time which is why my approach has been, that's why you don't let it in the first place, because we're gonna discover that this is a problem. And I think it's notable that uh, the gentleman, I think he said Rocky Hill or Rocky Point. Um, I don't recall us having any complaints from that area up until now. Maybe uh, I've missed them. I, I lose track of all the various roads in the neighborhoods, but my premise, and I know uh, John Boltz kept saying, well, show me the data, show me the data. My premise has been that there's lots of problems throughout town. It's just most of us put up with it and we don't complain about it. And there's a lot of issues arising with short-term rentals that people just don't hear about because we just grind our teeth and just put up with it. So again, I don't believe that allowing these in uh, meets the requirement of allowing peaceful and quiet enjoyment of residential neighborhoods saying that someone can't rent a house that they don't live in um, for under 30 days doesn't stop them from enjoying the peaceful, quiet enjoyment of their residential neighborhood. They are still free to rent that house for 30 days. They are still free to rent that house all year round. It's just we're not going to allow you to have continuous commercial turnover in these units every single week. And with that, I realize, I, I, oh, last point, and if you guys don't like the days, and it sounds like we're gonna workshop this because enough of uh, you guys, enough of you don't like it, don't vote for it if you don't like it. <laughs> Saying, I don't like this, but I'll go, don't vote for it. If all of us, if a majority of us don't like it, just don't vote for it. I'm not gonna be voting for it. I'm gonna be voting no this entire way through, but it is what it is, and I'm, I'm done beating this dead horse, and I'm gonna be quiet. Thanks, Chris. Um, 
And as you know, I am with you voting against this, but for different reasons, because I also think it runs afoul of other goals we have in the comp plan with regard to housing and community. And I think those issues are only going to come up further as we delve into another item on the agenda this evening, the IDEA committee and um, housing is going to come up again. And so for the very same reason, I will not be supporting any short-term rental ordinance that doesn't severely restrict short-term rentals. Um, but I did just want to address, Ms. Dunham had one more question about the termination. Um, just to explain that piece of the ordinance would just be essentially a reset so that there wouldn't be existing permits that had been obtained under other rules carrying forward. It would just, that would, that termination of existing permits would mean that everyone would be starting fresh on the same page with the new ordinance and the new rules. Um, Jamie? Yeah, and thanks for remembering that. The other point too is that with the new ordinance, the permits will run with the calendar year. So that whether you get the permit in January or you get it in November, it's only good for that calendar year. Um, so there won't be a rolling, you know, January to, uh, you know, uh, June to June, uh, as an example, um, duration for the permit. So uh, that was the other, the other reason. So for both turning off the old permits, but also setting the calendar uh, back to day one for, for the beginning of January. Um, you know, I, I just, um, you know, Chris, I, I, I continue to respect your position on this. I, I just, I just have to say that I disagree with it because um, as you said, and I've said many times before, um, you know, the, the regulations that we have before us um, specifically do address the quiet enjoyment part because it, in my opinion, will eliminate the portions that are, are contributing to their being, you know, you know, they're not being good quiet enjoyment. Um, I also think that it's consistent with the housing goals because if we're eliminating real estate speculators that are buying properties um, or, or people that are just using unoccupied properties for short-term rental basis that conceivably puts more um, homes, uh, you know, back uh, either for long-term rental, uh, which is, you know, a, an objective of part of the housing goal, um, or just, you know, puts, puts those ha that housing stock back into the market. Um, and, um, you know, as, as far as business activity in residential neighborhoods, um, if regulated properly, I don't see how this is any, any um, less consistent with any of the other um, already permitted um, light activities in those neighborhoods today. In fact, I think it's less so. So, um, you know, I, I, I understand the points you're making. I just happen to disagree with them for those reasons, so. Yes, Chris, go ahead. Uh, so I don't say this facetiously, Jamie, but I really appreciate the comment you just made um, because my, my issue is all about the decision-making process that we follow. And uh, like I was saying, I, I might want to order a cheese pizza, um, but if the rest of you say, oh, we want this Hawaiian, I'll be like, Ugh. but nevertheless, you chose something off the menu. So although I don't agree with what you said, I am very appreciative of the fact that you laid out why you think it meets the criteria. And that's, that's the, the aspect of the decision-making process that I feel is often lacking. Um, so I, I just wanted to thank you for doing that. Thank you. Um, Okay, so is there any further discussion before we send this back to workshop? No, um, and I did just wanna note also on that, um, one of the things I was referring to when I said that there were things where on points on which there were, was not consensus um, that Maureen included in there, one of them was with regard to the good neighbor conduct. Um, and that was something we had discussed. And, and when Maureen was drafting this, it was unclear, you know, whether we wanted that in. There were a few counselors saying yes. And so she put in something so we can also review that. It's on page 10, beginning at line 35, good neighbor conduct. Um, we can also review that at the workshop. 
So, um, okay. Do we, I, I'm having a total mom brain moment. Um, do we need a motion to refer this to the workshop? It, that would be good, uh, Madam Chair, if, if, you, if you'd like to set that date for 7.20 at uh, 7 p.m. Or, or, or to follow after the uh, council meeting on 7.20, uh, that's, a, that's a, an available date. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to refer this to workshop for the 20th at 7 p.m.? Yes, Valerie Devereaux. So um, that we refer this, the SDRs, to uh, a workshop on 7.20 at 7 p.m. Is there a second? Caitlin Jordan? Um, any further discussion? All right, all in favor? Uh, I'll call, call the roll, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Valerie Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Jeremy Gabrielson? Councillor Jamie Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penny Jordan? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Straw? Yes. And Chairman Valerie Adams? Yes. The motion passes unanimous, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda, um, number 96-2020, with regard to short-term rental permit fees, um, slightly different matter, I imagine we may be able to address this this evening. Um, is there anyone from the public who wishes to comment on this item? And again, please limit your comments to three minutes per person and identify yourself by name and address. And I'll again just note there are 34 attendees at this point. Um, so you can use the Zoom raise hand function if you wish to comment. Seeing no one, um, we will move along. Okay, um, and there, in the in the packet this evening, um, there's a fee schedule. It's also laid out in the agenda that the short-term rental permits, um, the fee would be $250 effective immediately and then $500 effective January 1, 2021. So do I have a motion to amend the town fee schedule with regard to these short-term rental permits? So move, Valerie. Penny, um, is there a second? Jeremy, any discussion? Yes, Jeremy. Sorry for using my actual hand instead of the raise hand function. Um, I um, so I, I just have a question about the um, the portion of the fee that is effective immediately. Uh, with regard to, I believe it was um, Ms. Dunham's comment that many of these um, short-term rental operators are operating essentially without income this year and likely will not have many guests for the remainder of the year, um, as well as the note in the memo that there's not likely to be a lot of renewals over this time period. I wonder if it might not just make as much sense to either retain our existing $50 annual fee structure as the fee due for the remainder of the calendar year for anyone whose permits run out between now and then, or waive the fee and everybody pay, extend the fee period and everyone pays the new fees starting on January 1. Penny? I, I assume that that the increase had something to do with engaging um, uh, a third party in order to help us do monitoring at this time. Uh, because there, even though there may be people who are not uh, doing short-term rentals at this point in time with permits, there may be people who are doing short-term rentals at this time who may not have permits. I thought that it was to get us kind of into that, being able to pay for
Penny, I, well, I don't know if you had something more to say, but I, I lost you for a second. I don't know. If I want to. I can Matt address that. Is that are we looking to engage a third party at this point in time, in order to? Um, uh, and so that's why the fee would be increased immediately. Madam Chair, if you'd like me to, I, I could respond to Councillor Jordan's question. Please do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I may, through the chair. Uh, yes, we uh, we currently have contracted with Hamari to provide that short-term uh, rental, uh, so they are in the process of coming up to speed. So we have we will incur expense. Uh, I will say many many of our uh, short-term rental renewals have taken place, but there are others who may renew later. Uh, to to Councillor Gabrielson's uh, question, uh, there are. Uh, uh, contrary to Ms. Dunham's uh, point, there are still many people who are uh, renting uh, their properties out, uh, but there are there's a very few uh, who may need to renew during the year. We are looking to help offset uh, the cost of the uh, software that we are going to be using in the service. Uh, so we're looking at that. I think the lion's share of it will be captured after the first of the year when uh, the new fee structure goes into effect. Uh, that was a, uh, a live discussion between uh, myself, uh, Maureen, and Ben uh, McDougal, our code officer, as far as trying to implement that. Uh, it, it will be very few, but we are looking to try to find a way to enterprise the, uh, the service uh, provided for the short-term rental um, software and services so we can at least try to uh, have it be self-sustaining. But we anticipate the lion's share of the revenue will come after the turn of the year. Uh, when when the new ordinance has one taken effect and two, uh, most people will start renewing on the calendar year basis at that point. And then the other point, uh, thinking about that is there won't be any new uh, short term rentals due to the moratorium that currently exists as well. So this would be for renewals that take place who did not tend who did not tend to uh, take care of their renewal prior to uh, the change in the fee structure. Uh, Sometimes uh, we benefit from it, and sometimes uh, uh, we get caught by the increase in the fee and the fee structure. So, thanks, Matt. Um, Valerie D. I was just curious if the five hundred dollar fee is going to be enough to um, make it self-sustaining. The program self-sustaining. The other piece of it is that. Our um, code enforcement spends a lot of time with short-term rentals, so do our police department. And it just seems that um, it really isn't self-sustaining with, with a $500 fee. So I'm just curious if that's something we can also look at in a workshop or talk about because we spend our code enforcement, I'm, I don't know how much time out of his day he spends just on short-term rentals, but it's a lot of time and I'm guessing that he may have to, we may have to hire another person to work with him based on um, short term rentals or it may be something that comes up over the next year or two. So I think that that's something we need to look at also. Uh, Jamie. Um. So at $500 and the estimated 150 short-term rental units that are operating today, um, that's $75,000 in revenue. And the cost of the contract is $8,000. So that's 60, nearly $67,000 difference to cover any number of costs um, or just revenue to the town. Um, so, I mean, it, it seems like it's more than sufficient to cover that. Um, secondly, I, I think, you know, there's invaluable benefit to the town, um, to try and, um, over the next number of months, uh, both get familiarized with this vendor and the software that they use, um, and, and start to chip away at the gap that we know exists between 
those that are operating and those that aren't permitted um, so that we can, you know, start to bring them under the tent and get, you know, get them compliant. Um, and this will go a long way to doing that. The third thing is that in the example that Ms. Dunham gave where, you know, some operators have chosen not to, um, not to rent out their properties this year because of the public health emergency, which um, I particularly appreciate. Um, I think that, you know, there's, there's nothing that says that those people who have made that choice have to get a permit for this year. You know, in the case of Ms. Dunham earlier, they already have one at the $50 mark. Um, I would actually wonder if, if it's demonstrably provable that you haven't been operating yours, um, you know, if, if there's any consideration that we as the town should give to refunding that amount, um, if somebody hasn't actually, um, you know, had any activity um, at their property through their own choice, particularly um, for the choice that, for the for the rationale that Ms. Dunham gave of um, trying to do so to ensure public health. So um, I'd be all for supporting that if, if we took that up as a secondary item, but as, as far as the um, implementation for the remainder of this year and the cost that's associated with that, I, I have no problem with it. And it sounds like at $500, we're more than covering costs and, and anticipated burden on the existing resources. Chris? So I, I find this both too high and too low um, and don't like it. Um, as I had noted in prior meetings, I, I could have conceivably supported an ordinance that allowed a two week a year rental. I think that would have accomplished the goal that we've had people come in and tell us, so uh, I need this in order to help pay my property taxes. Um, so if we start, or oh, I'll start from the position of, okay, this is where it would have been justified. What would a fee have been that would have been reasonable in that situation? So it seems too high in the sense that if someone's just renting it one week a year or two weeks a year, having a $250 fee seems pretty steep. Um, and yet it also seems too low because we're also saying that 250 is the same fee we're going to be charging someone that's renting all year long. That's going to have continuous monitoring and potentially issues arising. Um, so I, I think it, when you have a flat rate, it's much like with the trolleys where I was opposed to the trolley fees because it encourages them to just ram as many trolleys through as they can because it's a flat rate. It's an all you can eat buffet. And what we're doing is we're, chart we're setting a permit fee that's an all you can eat buffet, even though the fee structure itself is presumably rooted in uh, the ongoing costs that we incur in monitoring and enforcing the various restrictions that arise from short term rentals. So for that reason, I think it should be a, a gradient that's tied to how frequently people are actually engaging in the activity. Any further discussion on the fee schedule? Okay, so we do have a motion on the table. Oh, sorry, Jamie, yes. Sorry, I, I just don't know, I don't know how it's practical to accomplish what you just suggested, Chris, because I mean, I don't know that anybody realistically goes into it saying, well, I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to hit this many nights or something like this, you know, re regardless of what cap we wind up putting on or anything like that. But if, you know, if somebody says, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this for two weeks and then, oh, well, actually the, the limit's 90 days, you know, this has been going well, I'm going to do it for that. I mean, how do you, how do you even envision truing that up? I, I just don't understand how that would be possible. I'll, I'll um, use and, and again, I, I just real quick, and I, I think I think part of this discussion reverts back to what is the purpose of the fee in its in its in the first place, right? So, is, is the purpose of the fee simply to cover costs, um, or is it to in some way be a deterrent or suppress the act, you know, suppress the desire to engage? You, you know, I, I think all those things need to be considered. And the last point around fee is that. Even if somebody's, you know, only um, renting their place out for two weeks or, or, or fairly light use, like you're suggesting, if, if I'm not mistaken, at $500, that's, that's less than one night for a lot of places um, for this type of rental activity. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, it's still, I, I still don't have issue with it, but. Uh, so, uh, if, if I go to get a uh, fishing license, I have to select if it's going to be fresh water or fresh and salt water. So it would be similar. If I'm gonna rent for two weeks, it's a particular amount. If I wanna do more than two weeks, I have to get the, the larger fee. So I'd structure it in that way. 
um, and have a menu of one, two, uh, have at least two options, if not three or four options. So just like with fishing licenses, just like a boating license is going in freshwater, saltwater, I do it that way. And um, you, you make a good point that there are some of these that do charge 500 a night, but I haven't done this myself, but presumably like if I want to rent a room in my house, no one's gonna pay 500 a night to, live, to be in my house. I might get 50, 75, $100. But so my I'm assumption, <laughs> who knows? So uh, it's the straw house. Uh, so my assumption is that, that the, the numbers are a lot lower for for your average house, but what do I know? So. Uh, Penny, yes. Um, Chris, to your point, it's like if we were to take that example that somebody says I'm only going to rent for two weeks, so I you almost have a, a scale uh, relative to the fee, then you get into the monitoring of that. And um, what if then the person said, oh, I, I need another week or two. So then you actually uh, need to monitor that, that usage based on what their um, permit fee they paid, which could become a bit unwieldy. Uh, and you may need this service in order to monitor that. So I'm, I'm a Jamie, it's, it's a, I'm going to say this and then you're going to say, see, I told you it was a business in a residential zone. Um, it's a business proposition. It's part, it's part of doing business. So you pay the fee because I'm saying it, you're running a business. So. Um, Matt, did you want to respond to that? If I may, just to, to Councillor Straw's uh, 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 concern, uh, yeah, the challenge is enforcement, uh, as Councillor Jordan also mentioned, because uh, you know you would you would probably we'd probably have to clone Ben a number of times to have him chase down or track down all of the uh, violations that currently. Uh, an example would be that the, there's a there was a moratorium until uh, July one uh, that rentals had to be for 30 days or less and the council is well aware of the emails you received where folks uh, were trying to uh, either work around that issue uh, creatively, oftentimes not so creatively, and uh, the code officer and the police department were receiving complaints on a consistent basis. And I'm not saying we don't like the work, uh, but there is plenty there. And uh, uh, I know with the software, it, it will help with enforcement, but uh, I, I do think, uh, to try to have it on a scope and scale and then to try to monitor it and then see if they're doing it. It's a question of having, you know, especially if we're looking at having neighbors, uh, you know, for, and oftentimes drop the dime on, uh, on a, an offending uh, property, uh, we, you end up trying to have the game of gotcha take place all the time. And it's, I, I think it'd be a, a very difficult enforcement um, situation and that would probably set us up for failure. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, any any other discussion on the this item? Okay, um, so we do have a motion on the table and I'm going to call the vote at this point. Um, Matt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? No. And Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries six to one, Chairman Adams. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda, item number 97-2020. Uh, um, consider appointments committee recommendations relating to a diversity and inclusion committee. Um, we now have 36 attendees. Uh, this is the opportunity for public comment on this item. Please do limit your comments to about three minutes per person and please identify yourself by name and address. Um, you can use the Zoom raise hand function and then once recognized, you'll be given permission to speak. Anyone from the public wishing to comment? All right. 
Um, seeing no one. You have one? Uh, yep, oh. there is one. Um, uh, Maureen Clancy, Madam Chair. Yes, Maureen Clancy, um, go ahead. Hi everyone, good evening. Maureen Clancy, 11 Hemlock Hill Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Thank you for, to the town council for coming up with the idea to put together this ad hoc committee. I would just like to note, at least in my review of the comments or the purpose of the committee, that it feels somewhat, how can, I, don't, I don't really know the word, but it feels like, you know, make recommendations, find solutions, you know, but it doesn't feel overly um, action oriented, of which I would like to see. And so I would like to see some language that's a little bit more forceful, I guess. And I would also like to note that we have a Cape Diversity Coalition that already exists. And somehow we don't need to duplicate efforts, but um, include that and, and enhance the work that's already there. So I think reviewing policy of the town council to make sure that we don't have policies that are um, restrictive or racist in some capacity. Um, but I think I would just like to see the language a little bit more forceful and a little bit more um, uh, action oriented and reflection of the, of the group that already exists. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, anyone else from the public wishing to comment? Okay. I don't see anyone further. And I did want to note also that um, with regard to this item, because it is a pretty big discussion topic and um, we may have a lot to discuss that um, Matt and I had also talked about the possibility of workshopping this a little bit um, at that meeting, if that's the case, rather than trying to workshop on the fly. Um, but I'll, I'll get a sense of what the council is looking at before we make any decisions. Um, Jamie, were you looking to make a motion or did you have a... Um, I actually just wanted to respond to the two comments from Ms. Clancy, if I could. Sure. Um, so number one, thanks for the comments, Maureen. Um, they're appreciated. I think um, it may be benefit um, the discussion here um, potentially just to remind, um, you know, the public in general about sort of the purpose of advisory committees. Um, and in particular, um, an ad hoc one like this that's being recommended um, to come back with recommendations of which I I can only assume that one recommendation as would be consistent with other ad hoc committees like this in the past would be the formation of a standing committee. Um, but um, the, the, the action that I think Maureen, you might be looking for um, would presumably be taken by the council or by staff if it was something that didn't require council action um, to put into place. So a committee like this would um, you know, do the research um, to kind of do the discovery and due diligence work to come back to the council and say, here are the things that require action. And the council is the body that's actually um, empowered to, to take those actions, not, not necessarily the committee itself. And that, that's not just on this topic or this particular committee, but is consistent with all committees, um, short of the quasi-judicial committees like the planning board and the um, uh, uh, board of zoning appeals and things like that. So. Um, so that might just be helpful for everybody to have a little bit better understanding of um, uh, and, and, and might put some of the, the way this is worded into a little bit different light and different context. Um, and then the other thing I would say is um, I, I completely appreciate, um, you know, the work of the Cape Diversity Coalition. I know that it's been growing um, in terms of its interest and, in, in, um, you know, active participation and things like that. Um, I would say that there are a number of other examples in town where there's um, maybe multiple groups that are working towards the same objective, but still exist um, as separate, you know, separate committees and separate groups. So whether it be the Fort Williams Park Committee, that's an advisory committee um, advising the town council and the Friends of Fort Williams, or whether it be the, you know, co um, conservation committee 
and the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, uh, or, or you know, things like that, where you know, one is a group of um, you know private citizens that might have a, a you know a shared interest or objective. The other is a group of folks that are um, specifically through an appointments process brought together to advise the council on matters that are of importance to the town um, at large. So I would hope that both, like, like is the case with all of those groups, um, that there's good collaboration and, and good cooperation between the two. But I think that there's clear purpose um, and certainly, um, you know, by definition of, of, of uh, the council, council rules and the, and the town charter that calls for there being sort of a separation between uh, an advisory committee to the council versus um, uh, a privately organized group, so. Right, and just to add to that, um, I know I've, I've gotten some additional correspondence um, regarding action steps, um, and I can see how this would not seem as action oriented, but it really is sort of the, you know, we're taking steps towards action and this is, this is one of those um, and a way to, to um, open up that discussion to be more inclusive so that it's not just the council making these actions. Um, Caitlin? I put my hand up to say basically what Jamie had said about the creation of the ad hoc and that most likely it's going to lead to a standing committee, but to remind people that, you know, they're advising the council to take action. But Jamie covered it beautifully. Thank you, Jamie. Penny? Um, a couple of things. Um, number one, uh, I understand, Caitlin and uh, Jamie, what you're, you're saying about action. Um, but I also agree that the, and I appreciate all of the work that the group did putting this together, I truly do, but I think there's a, a way to make it feel more actionable through uh, stronger words as to what the, the charge is. Um, and that, I mean, I could go into all of the uh, suggestions that I have relative to the, to that, uh, but I think that um, uh, Valerie's um, kind of uh, thought and Matt's thought about maybe workshopping this a bit could create um, more dialogue around this. Um, I understand ad hoc. I understand um, that it's a um, a step in uh, in the right direction. But I think to take a 12 month period to put a permanent um, uh, structure in place really uh, doesn't serve to recognize the importance of the issue in uh, our society today. Um, and so as I look through this, I identified near term and long term actions that could come out of this and um, and those are the types of things that I would like to discuss within a workshop. And, um, and I would think that pretty much uh, out of the chute, there would be some findings which says here is what a permanent um, uh, committee may look like and what they would be doing because this, uh, I think deserves um, more uh, focus, um, commitment, and it's a long-term journey that we have in front of us in order to make up for what we haven't done for the last 200 years. So um, that's kind of where I come from. Yeah, and I was, yeah, I was thinking a workshop. I have some, I, I so appreciate the work that you guys did getting this started, but it was sort of my understanding when we met last and discussed this that um, the appointments committee would kind of get started and then we could come together again to figure it all out. So, um, Jeremy? 
Um, great, thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, just so first, I'd also just like to speak to the point of um, including the folks who've been involved with the Cape uh, Diversity Coalition. Just wanted to note that uh, a number of folks who've been involved with the Diversity Coalition have been involved through the process of getting this conversation started and also participated in the Appointments Committee meeting on this. So we have had good substantive input um, from folks who have been engaged on this issue for a long time, and, and I deeply appreciate that. Uh, I, I think to the question of uh, what action to look at tonight, I would, I would strongly urge the council to move forward with, um, with this, creating this ad hoc committee. I understand the impetus for wanting to get action and that's why I would urge us to vote on that tonight. Uh, we had an, a fair amount of discussion in the um, appointments committee about how to structure this so that um, it would be an ad hoc committee. We did put the 12 month um, limit on it, but the idea all along was if this group gets together and they can do their work and come up with uh, recommendations or a set of recommendations for action that the council can move on more quickly than that 12 month window, I would sincerely hope that they can bring that back to the council sooner. Um, the 12 months is really a limit. Um, and that, you know, that was why we, we had under E to provide report <laughs> in, in parentheses. Um, there may be some, some shorter term action items that can come back from this ad hoc committee fairly quickly. Indeed, I hope there are. Uh, and I, I also just in terms of wanting to capture some of the momentum around this issue and also build some forward momentum, would hope to get this um, through the council tonight so that we can begin the appointments process. Just looking at the calendar, that's a, we're already pushing this back probably into September for a first meeting by the time we advertise for appointments and interview folks and get them um, get those uh, nominations ratified by the council. So, um, you know, if, if we do go to the workshop and, uh, you know, if that's the decision of the council, that's the decision of the council. Um, but I hope we could also then vote on that action on Monday so that we're not continuing to push this timetable out farther and further into the future. Um, I, I'd really like to see us make up for lost time. Yeah, and Matt and I had actually discussed that also that we could, because we could have the workshop on Monday that we could then get it on the August agenda. But I, if we have a meeting anyway next week um, to address other items, then we could do that. Matt, did you want to address that? Or did I sort of capture it all anyway? You did, you did okay. great, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, Jamie? Um, Jeremy, I totally agree and I'm glad you brought up those points and um, you know, thanks for articulating what the sort of the um, feeling coming out of the committee was. I, I think one way this will likely differ greatly from a lot of other ad hoc committees that have um, been brought together for other purposes in the past is oftentimes those are, you know, um, very narrowly focused with a specific, um, you know, either problem they're looking at or, or, or uh, you know, topic that they're focused on. And there's at the end of the process, some report that's generated that's sort of the conclusion of the work. I would hope and expect that there will probably be a number of things that come up through the work of this proposed committee um, that are immediately actionable. Um, so not something that needs to wait. And I, I, I interpreted the 12 months, just as you said, Jeremy, that that was sort of a, you know, maximum amount of time needed, not, not the, the, um, uh, you know, the expected full duration that, that they would take. Um, but if, you know, if there's a recommendation that says, you know, a certain action should be taken and that's something that comes up in the first meeting of the committee, I expect that the council would hear about that at their, you know, very next opportunity. And if it's something that can, you know, be actioned upon, um, that we would do that and not necessarily, um, you know, just sit around and wait for 12 months for, for a final formal report to come back. Valerie, G. I'm just going to follow up um, with what Jer Jeremy and Jamie said. That's how we were looking at it, is that we would give a 12 months total 
but we felt that there would be so many different things coming before the um, council recommendations, action items that um, would all be happening within that 12 months. And one of those items would be creating a standing committee. We, we talked quite a bit about the time frame. Uh, a lot of people that were involved in the uh, meeting wanted this to happen quickly. So that's why we were hoping to get this um, voted on today because we have to go through the appointments committee. We were hoping to set up a committee in September or October. Um, my concern is if we push it off another month, then we're looking at November or basically on our regular December schedule and starting in January. So we were hoping to keep the momentum going by um, really moving this quicker. There may be, um, can we vote on this? And then if we want to change some of the um, action items or charges, can we change them later on? I, I don't know, I'm just asking that as a question because I'd love to get to see this um, momentum. And I want to um, really thank the Cape Diversity Coalition uh, quite a few members reached out to me. We've spoken. There were members that were on the call. There are members who would like to be appointed to the committee. So I really want to thank them for being such a valuable partner in this. And um, we also had the um, chair of uh, Cape Elizabeth School Board, Heather Altenberg, was on the call. Well, the meeting in the meeting, and so was our um, superintendent, Donna Wolfram. So we had some um, input from the schools, and they're also looking at putting together a committee. So um, I'm open to workshopping this if, any, if you want to workshop it, uh, but I'd really like to see us keep the momentum going and get this thing um, started. Um, Chris and then Penny. Uh, so it, uh, it's not a deal breaker for me, but uh, from a process and procedure standpoint, um, I would have preferred the structure of the charge to match the structure we've used for other ad hoc committees in the past. So if we do go to workshop, I would like to see this um, restructured so it matches the other ad hoc committee charges. Um, but again, it's not a deal breaker if we proceed with this uh, format. But I was curious um, if uh, the appointment committee could comment on the purpose. The purpose, uh, at the end, it says that uh, one of the purposes is that uh, the committee would engage in a review of the comprehensive plan to support diversity in housing and transportation. Uh, you'll recall uh, one of my critiques of the comp plan was I didn't think that it was the uh, selection of the members was representative, um, re represented a good uh, cross section of the town. Um, are you contemplating that the committee will make recommendations to revise the comp plan or simply review the comp plan? Because I won't support it if it just says review, but I will support it if we add in something about make recommendations for the revision of the comp plan. And I think that goes to Ms. Clancy's point about let's give it some teeth. And I want it, it we, we just had a number of you all say that you're open to revising the comp plan within a year of passing it. So I'd like to, I'd like to see you stick to that. Um. Penny, do you mind if Valerie just respond? I think she was trying to respond to that. Do you mind? No, okay, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, Chris, that, that's what our thought was that um, this committee would have some teeth. They would look at the comp plan. They would give us recommendations of revisions that need to take place. They'd look at other policies, their town policies, and decide if there's revisions that need to take place. So I think that would be a really important action for them to take. Um, Penny? I want to respond to um, uh, Jeremy and Jamie. I understand totally how, uh, how planning can work and how you execute on a plan, but if it doesn't say within the duties of this committee to uh, look at near term, uh, I didn't see in here where it said um, we're going to take and create an iterative process for identifying and um, 
uh, issues and sending recommendations to the council. If it had said that, uh, then um, then I can I can agree. But unless we explicitly say that, then all we're doing is sitting here and saying this is what we think is going to happen. Whereas if the duties it, part of it is an iterative process of uh, issue identification and recommendation uh, to the council on uh, areas of um, uh, inequality, racism, et cetera, et cetera, then I think that's a good charge or duty for the committee. But it, it doesn't say that. And when I listened to the uh, meeting, what I heard, kept hearing is, and in 12 months, there will be a report. And that's what I heard several times. And I'm going, oh my God, 12 months, that's like an eternity. And by that time, this council loses two members. I want to make sure that we get a committee in place before uh, we see any transition on, in membership of the council, because I think we have a council here that truly believes in, uh, in uh, addressing the challenges that might be here in town. Um, Jeremy and then Jamie, um, but it, it does seem like we're really getting into a discussion of um, this item that may be more appropriate for a workshop. And we would only be delaying by one week if we set this on to Monday. So um, go ahead and Jeremy and then Jamie, but then I think just to keep things moving along and look for either a motion to approve the recommendation or to refer to workshop. Um, I'll, I'll be quick. I, I don't have any problem. I, I, I actually like the idea of adding that language in, Penny. Um, I'd also just note that um, the membership of this committee includes a counselor. So I, you know, I would hope that whichever one of this us that is um, would feel empowered to bring items from this committee back on a timeline that is appropriate um, for the actions. That I recognize that uh, the membership includes a counselor, which is another area that I would like to discuss. So, uh, Jamie? I was actually just going to make that exact same point about it, it including a counselor. So, the, you know, the, what, what I think I um, gather is the, as the consensus opinion here tonight, would I assume be reflected um, no matter which of us was the representative on the committee in terms of um, wanting to see more iterative action? Um, I mean, as, as I envision the work of this committee, I suspect that it'll be a bit more, um, you know, it, almost Lego block in its approach where, okay, right now we're looking at hiring practices and that's what we're drilling deep on. And here's some things that, that you know, uh, can come out of that, that, that are immediate actions to recommend. Okay. Here's awareness training, um, gaps that we see, uh, you know, here's some immediate actions that these people are not receiving proper awareness training and should. And so let's get that schedule, you know, each of these things ticking off sort of as, as they go, um, you know, uh, not some compilation report, like I said, that, um, you know, would, would be, you know, where the issues grow stale and, and the momentum fades and all that kind of thing. So, um, and I, I frankly think if, if, if we do take that approach with this group, that each one of these things will actually build that momentum further upon itself, right? So as we're doing things and as we're making steps in the right direction and as we're taking action that, um, Number one, we're, we're doing the right thing. Number two, people will feel like, you know, they're being heard and, and being part of the process and, and seeing improvements and change. And, and number three, it'll, it'll, you know, you know, keep, keep them, keep the momentum moving forward in the direction that it needs to be going. So. Jeremy. So I move that we um, establish the committee um, for the recommendation here from the appointments committee. Um, is there a second for that motion, Jeremy? 
Um, and Madam Chair, I also just wanted to note, I know it's um, out of turn oh, and the hand has gone down. I was just noting that we had a couple of folks um, in the public who were um, expressing a desire to say something with their hand. Um, yes, I, I did see that there were a couple of hands raised. Um, this particular part of the discussion is not um, not the time for public comment. It's when the council discusses it together. Um, there will be an opportunity to, uh, sorry, um, discuss items not on the agenda later. Yes, Chris, did you? I, I just want to reiterate that point. I, we don't always kind of stick to that, but I always feel it's a little unfair when we kind of cherry pick, oh, we'll, we'll suddenly reopen discussion to one person versus another person. And um, it, I, I understand the intent and it's well intended to, we want to give everyone an opportunity to make comments, but w when we're bending and changing the rules on when public comment period is, it, 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 it doesn't always sit well with me. Yeah, I think we do generally try to, to stick to that format um, of discussion for the item. Um, so there is a motion and a second. Um, any discussion before we vote on the recommendation? Um, so I guess I, I would just add that, um, and let me just pull up that recommendation here. Oh, my million windows. Um, so there had been, I think, some, some discussion in the public, some comments about um, the makeup of the committee, that it would be seven members, um, but one would be a school board member and one town council member, and whether that makeup is appropriate. Um, and I was just wondering from the appointments committee, what kind of discussion you had around that and if you could just share why you thought it was important to have the town council member and the school board member on this committee taking up two spots that could otherwise be held by community members you want me yeah, to address that really. that? sure well i think um what we were looking at was since this is an ad hoc committee we were looking at um, a counselor and a um, school board person, I, really a counselor to help move the process along and um, someone from the school to give their input because they're going to have um, a committee also. But it wasn't anything that, um, that we have to have, but it just felt like during the discussion that it would be um, it would be good to have those two uh, as part of the one town concept and creating this as a town um, committee. We just felt that it would um, be beneficial. Did Jeremy? you think oh. about having a liaison model rather than having the two spots be taken on the committee? Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. And then they wouldn't be um, voting. We did talk about having nine uh, nine members also, because we were really looking at including a lot of people. But as um, Matt pointed out, then you have problems with quorums. The, if you have nine people rather than seven, it's a little more difficult at times to have a quorum. So um, we could definitely do it as liaisons rather than um, voting members of a committee. Um, Penny? Uh, that's where I was headed to uh, Valerie Adams is uh, and more of a liaison model um, in order that we can uh, have greater representation from general uh, population. Um, and with any committee, they have um, a even ad hoc. They have different, they have specific protocols such as a chair and um, et cetera. So, um, I'm, I'm with Valerie Adams, I think liaison model. Jeremy? 
Um, yeah, I, I fully support a liaison model. I would just note part of the discussion too, uh, which um, our appointments committee was also intended by Superintendent Wolfram, as well as um, Heather Altenberg from the school board, is that, that the school board is also looking to establish a concurrent committee um, that will be running at the same time. So there, uh, the hope that, that would they expressed and that we expressed to them was that those two committees would talk to each other, work together, potentially even hold joint meetings. So it's not just the five people, there, there will also likely be an additional five um, public spots on that committee as well. Um, but I, I, I'd be entirely in favor of moving that from a council member of the committee to a council liaison. I have no problem with that again. Chris? Uh, so uh, I know that in the appointment committee in the past, we had talked about the fact that, um, in Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, if you recall, um, that there isn't anything, I don't think any of the ordinances or any of the policies or anything that precludes us from having uh, people under the age of 18 on our boards. And we thought, oh, you know, that would be kind of cool if uh, we had younger people involved in uh, committees that seemed like it would be appropriate for them to be on them. Um, it, so I, I, I'm, uh, I, I see that the notion of two student representatives, uh, and I just want to say I, I, I appreciate that being in there. I also like the fact that it's up to two because um, we're in some ways, as the appointment committee knows, uh, we're, we're subject to the whims of who applies. Um, and <laughs> so I, I'm very, I, I, I like that language. Um, but uh, I was hoping you could speak to the five members Cape Elizabeth residents, because although we've talked about the age before, I don't recall if we've ever talked about whether, uh, whether committee members need to be town residents or not. And uh, did we look into that and does it pose an issue at all? Well, I'll respond to that. We um, had a discussion about um, ages, but my understanding, and um, Caitlin, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, is that um, under our ordinance, you have to be a Cape Elizabeth um, resident, or we just recently changed it, didn't we, to include um, someone who works in Cape Elizabeth also? Weren't there teachers that were able to um, be on committees? No, so I believe under the ordinance committee, under the ordinance, you have to be a Cape Elizabeth um, resident. And so it currently it says five of the members would be Cape Elizabeth residents. So um, was that intended? Uh, we, might not, we might have to fix that language there, I'm just noting. You just mean fix it to say that all of the members would if that's a requirement again i don't know if what there i don't know if there's a restriction requiring people to be cape elizabeth residents but as it reads when i looked at that i thought it was five members from cape who that could be from outside of cape i think it just was referring to like at large members like not specific to anything they're they're going to be cape residents they're going to be at large members got it Okay. Um, so I also was hoping um, to see something that would address more explicitly in the duties, the more immediate actions that we need to take because when we developed the sign that is now in place, we had some discussion of whether there would be continuing signs um, whether there could be different messages, what kind of messages. Um, and I feel like those are all very upfront right now actions. Um, I think also things like uh, recommendations to the council on immediate steps that we can take as a council um, to become more aware of issues in our community. Um, one resident had recommended that we all um, in, read some materials, that there were certain materials that we should read as a council to sort of begin the training process. So um, I don't know if you had talked about as a committee, maybe putting in something about those more immediate recommendations to the council. Um, 
Um, Matt? If I may, Madam Chair, there are, uh, under the duties there, there's not a specific end date that comes as far as the duties and responsibilities of the committee. Uh, you know, there is advise the council on issues on potential, of potential racism and inequality. That doesn't have to come at the conclusion of the 12 month period. I think that can come at any time as they do their work. Uh, provide reports and recommendations for improvement. I don't think that those have a, a need to come after the end of 12 months. I think they could come at any time along there. And I thought that was part of the discussion uh, with the committee, uh, the appointments committee on that uh, part of it. Uh, and then review and make recommendations to the council on where there are opportunities for policy changes. Uh, I think many of those different areas can, can come at uh, any time then. Also, finally, the last point of explore community outreach to engage the community and receive uh, input on racism and inclusivity. I think they can engage the community via the signs. So if you did have that during you know, the month of August or September, you decided you wanted to, or for the next eight week period, you wanted the sign to change to uh, make the recommendation of the council to do uh, a different message, then I think uh, there's nothing that would forbid those recommendations to come at any time. Uh, to the council uh, to be responsive to needs as they do arise. If that if that's helpful. Yeah, I think I mean it's it's implied, but I was hoping it would just be a little bit more explicit so that the the okay. committee feels empowered to start directing the council right away. Um, so I don't know if we could put in something. Um, something that would convey that message. Uh, I'm just looking at the draft and seeing where it might fit. It can fit in the purpose or someplace up front because it's an overarching um, uh, direction. I think what we have constantly said is the way that we see this committee operating is, and it gets into a, uh, an iterative process uh, in identifying and addressing um, issues. Right. So, Penny, are you saying you think it's already there or we could add something? No, it isn't there. And that's what I said probably about 10 minutes ago, is that there's nothing there that says we have an expectation that uh, this, uh, this committee uh, is um, in a constant iterative process of identification, recommendation to the council. It's just ongoing in every aspect, everything they touch. Um, our goal is that as soon as something is identified and can have a recommendation. So it has to be upfront and overarching from my perspective. Yeah. Um, Jeremy? Thank you. I'm um, sorry. Um, so it sounds like there's two significant changes that people are talking about. and. I, I would suggest that one would be under item number one, that where it says up to seven members, that uh, we just strike from there to, the, to where it says residents, and then insert the word and up to stu two student representatives, and then strike the remainder of that sentence. So seven members up to two student, whoops, seven members up to two student representatives. Um, and then we can add a sentence that says, and the council shall also appoint a council liaison. So that would be one recommendation. Um, and then the other one would be to include a sentence at the end of the purpose statement, as Penny was just saying, uh, to the effect of the, the committee shall be empowered to bring ideas forward to the, council, the town council for immediate action or on an ongoing basis or iteratively bring issues forward to the council. I don't know if you want me to make those as amendments or separately or together or. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, are you making a, a motion to um, amend the motion 
to include I am it. making a, I can I'm making a motion to amend the motion and I can either make one or I can make two um, however it pleases the chair um, I think because Matt needs to call through all of these um, why don't you go ahead and make it as two and then we'll see if there's a second and any discussion and whether we need to so I make a motion that item number one now read membership. The idea committee shall consist of seven members, comma, and up to two student representatives, period. The council shall also appoint, the town council shall also appoint a liaison to this committee, period. Okay, so just, Sorry, I just that one and not the second one is your amendment. Well, I, I thought we were going to do them one at a time. Oh, I meant together since Matt has to call through. Okay. At time. Okay. So no, I can do. I'm I can end this furiously. <laughs> um, if you want me to do the other one, and and I may need Penny's help with this wording. <laughs> um, I would add at the end of the purpose. So number two, add at the end of purpose, the committee shall be empowered to bring forward recommendations to the town council for action on an iterative basis. Or does that work for you, Penny? Okay. Would you would you state the second half of that one more time, please, for me, Jeremy? Uh, uh, sorry, I've got. Shall be empowered sure. to bring bring ideas forward to the town council for, for action, action on an iter on an iterative basis. Mm -hmm. but if somebody wants to change that that last uh, prepositional phrase, I'd be glad for better wording. I got it. Okay. Is there a second? Um, Valerie D, any discussion? Um, Caitlin, do you have your hand up for discussion on this or from previously? It was to try and move it more in the direction of a workshop, but we're not headed there anymore. So That's... carry on. Um, Chris? That was my question. Uh, I, I, I'm lost. Were we going to a workshop or, or are we going uh, to work on it now? It seems like a lot of changes. Like I thought we were moving in the direction of going to a workshop to discuss this in a better way than on the fly. Matt, you got all this written down. Let's take a vote. I have lost in what you guys are, are doing and changing because it just seems like we probably should have gone to a workshop 15 minutes ago. So the, there is a motion on the table to approve the recommendation. Um, and so that's where we got into this. Um, now there is this proposed amendment. Um, if there is any interest in withdrawing motions, I'm a little bit confused about what we do with the amendment, whether we have to deal with that first or, but, but we do have that motion on the table. So we're not, we're not at a workshop at this point. We're just looking at the recommendation. Um, I see Penny in life and Jamie on I just have a question. Um, is it possible because it would, uh, I don't know how to ask the question. Number one, um, is it possible that um, this ad hoc committee um, doesn't have to live a year, that it becomes permanent um, at another point during that? 12 month period. I don't want to, my question is, can it create permanency at any point in time? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Matt? Uh, 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 if I may, through the chair, uh, Council Jordan, that's a great question. The council would have the opportunity to create it as a standing committee. You'd have to adjust the, uh, you know, you'd have to make the whole uh, committee creation process to go forward to, you know, just like you did with the energy committee last year. Uh, so if, you know, if the recommendation came out quicker or if the council changed their mind during the year that they wanted to take that action, uh, then if, as long as you appropriately took the steps 
uh, to have created that as a standing committee, you have the power to do that. Um, Jamie? Just as a follow on to that, um, it would actually require an ordinance change and all that kind of stuff to, to create the committee. So it's a little bit more involved than just saying, hey, we want to flip the switch to, to make this ad hoc committee a standing committee. Second of all, as a point I brought up previous meeting, I think we would want to um, set up the staggered term. So anytime you're creating a committee from scratch so that you have the natural roll off period um, and turnover, um, we would have to do it that way. That wasn't what I'd raised my hand for though, which is um, I don't think it's a big deal for us to vote on this tonight. There's a motion on the table to move this committee forward. Some, there's a similar uh, second motion to make some minor adjustments to language uh, as a point of order. We vote on the, the uh, amendment that was proposed. Depending on how that goes, we then vote on the initial motion if there's no more amendments, and then we move forward. So uh, if there's no other discussion, I say we call the question on the amendment. Um, Chris did have his hand raised. Yeah, uh, so I would vote no on the motion. Um, we're reinventing the wheel. It's and it's in part uh, because we're not workshopping this. Um, the actual, uh, if you look at any of the ad hoc committees in the past, they have um, basically stock language that we basically can just lift almost entirely. And as the, with this amended and as proposed, it might seem like minor things, but we're missing things like the town council following a recommendation from the appointments committee shall appoint X citizens. Uh, the, the, the town, and it would be something along the lines of the town council chair and the uh, school board chair will each be asked to designate one representative of the other bodies to serve as a uh, non-voting liaison. Uh, the committee shall appoint its own chair and secretary, things like that. And do we, have we assigned staff as part of this? The town planner shall be the principal staff member for the committee or so-and-so shall be this particular staff member. Those are the things that aren't in here. Um, and then uh, most of the ad hocs, we normally also uh, allocate them a budget of some sort, which is also missing from the charge. So it seems like minor things. It's like, uh, it's, it's lots of little tiny uh, uh, procedural things, but almost all of our other ad hoc committees, we have these components in there. And um, so it, it seems like we just need to sit down and go through and just kind of plug these things in. And we can do it now if you, you all want, but that's what I would have done at a workshop. Um. Jamie, did you have another question or were you just looking to call the question? I'll withdraw the motion. Um, so that's procedurally what I was uncertain about is now that we have a motion to amend the motion, if you withdraw your motion, do we need to address the motion to amend it? And I don't know the answer. No, it's moved. Okay. Um, so is there a motion to send this to workshop on uh, July 20th at 7 p.m. So moved. Caitlin, thank you. And Valerie Devereaux, was that a second? Okay. Um, any, any further discussion? All in favor? We'll start with uh, Councillor Devereaux. Yes. So I was just trying to keep my scorecard uh, clean here. I apologize for the delay. Uh, Councillor Gabrielson. Yes. Councillor Garvin. Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councillor Penny Jordan. Yes. Councillor Straw. Yes. And Chairman Adams. Yes. The motion carries seven to zero to move it to workshop for next uh, next Monday night at seven p.m. Thank you. Um, okay. Item number ninety-eight dash twenty twenty Fort Williams Park Committee recommended vendor for the master plan update. Is there any public comment on this item? Uh, Jim Kearney. And just a reminder, please do identify yourself by name and address for the record. My name is Jim Kearney. I live at 1015 Shore Road. I currently chair the Fort Williams Park Committee. I just want to let the council know that I'm here if you have any questions. I could go through kind of our process, but I think in the interest of, time, interest of time, I'll just tell you that I'm here if you have questions. Thank you. Uh, anyone else from the public wishing to comment on this item? Right. Uh, seeing no one, I'm looking for a motion from the council to confirm the selection of the Fort Williams Park Committee to contract with Richardson and Associates of Saco, Maine for the update of the Fort Williams Park Master Plan. Um, 
Jeremy, you have your hand up. Is that a motion? Yes, so moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, Penny? Second. Um, any discussion on this item? Jeremy? Uh, I just wanted to note um, my appreciation to the Fort Williams Park Committee for their work on this item. Uh, the uh, town received a number of very qualified bids for this and the committee did an excellent job uh, both of sorting through them and also I had the opportunity to sit in on the interviews with the, um, the firms that were uh, selected for the shortlist for the RFP. Uh, the ec all excellent proposals for work um, and, a, and uh, a lot of time and effort from the park committee just wanted to thank them for their, for their efforts. Thanks. Uh, Chris? Uh, yeah, Matt, not to put you on the spot, uh, but for the act, um, for the amount, did we budget 65000 originally? Is that right? If I may, Madam Chair, uh, the uh, budgeted amount was $65,000, and then in the, in, and that was in the uh, fiscal year 1920 budget, and then, uh, and then currently in the fiscal year 20 uh, budget, 2021 budget, there is an additional $25,000 uh, really, related to the project. So uh, we do have adequate funds and the, the uh, recommendation does come in uh, at a below budget. And so um, it looked like there were two options uh, proposed in the, um, the RFP. Um, and which one are we, be, was the recommendation that we go with A or B? And uh, Jim, uh, Kearney, your, your mic is live if you'd like to respond to that. Yeah, so it was option B, which we are referring to as Richardson Light, as in the lighter <laughs> proposals price-wise. Great, thank you. Oh, ah, Richardson Light there, that's, got, yeah. <laughs> got it, see it. Sorry. Okay, um, any other discussion? All in favor? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries uh, unanimously. Thank you. Um, all right, item number 99 2020, Town Center Traffic Study um, and this, the action would be to refer this to a future workshop. Um, anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one, um, we are looking for a motion to refer to workshop the Town Center Transportation Study dated June 2020, performed by T.Y. Lynn International. Um, and Matt, do we have an anticipated date for this workshop? We may look uh, for, for August or September for that, uh, whichever would please the council. Uh, we do have some transition points taking, uh, taking place, as you well know, with uh, Bob Malley uh, reti retiring and uh, we're in the process of uh, filling the position. Uh, but uh, we are looking at probably, we're thinking August or September, whichever would be at best, maybe September. Uh, but it is something that we, we have received. Uh, it is a council stated goal and uh, T.Y. Lynn has done a great job for that to help move that conversation forward. So, uh, you know, looking at the, at the torrid pace you've been on, maybe September could be a good opportunity. We may be at that time, have the opportunity to be uh, uh, in a live, uh, live setting uh, so you can have a full display on the wall uh, and it may be easier for presentation sake, but uh, it's up to the council with your direction, but uh, that could be a good time for that. Thanks. Okay, so looking for a motion. Uh, Valerie D, is there a second? Um, looks like Jeremy was first. Any discussion? All right, all in favor. Uh, Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes.
the, the motion carries seven to zero, Madam Chair. Thank you. Item number 100-2020, renewal of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club license. Um, anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one. Oh, we have, we oh. have one, Madam Chair, uh, Tam Tammy Walter. It, okay, go Hello. ahead. Tammy. Hello? Yes, we got you, Tammy. Hey, um, uh, it's Tammy Walter and Mark Mayones here with me. We're both here. So uh, could we both have three minutes? Actually, I just need Mark to talk because I don't, I'm all set. Okay, and if you could just, uh, just a reminder, um, identify your address as well for the record. Sure. Mark Mayone, the uh, president of Spurwink Rod and Gun Club, uh, 1250 Sawyer Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I just wanted to say, as you, many of you have seen, you probably have the report in front of you from uh, Chief Williams that uh, our, our, our issues that uh, we've, we've had have been over um, uh, shooting out of time on Sundays. Uh, we had a member of ours, so the, the genesis of us fixing that is um, one of our members suggested to us that the security system that we actually already had may have the ability to um, be time, we might be able to adjust the times on there to shut the access off when we want uh, or certain days off. So we called in a security professional who did an update on our system and um, and now we have and have implemented um, a time uh, we're able to shut off all the members except for the uh, officers of the club are not able to go down and use the range on those uh, Sunday morning uh, Sunday mornings, which seem to be the the predominant uh, calls that Chief Williams has had. Um, so that's as far as the times. Um, we've got a lot of exciting stuff going on, even during COVID down there. Um, we've we've got an archery program that's about to hit the road running. Uh, we're really excited for that. Um, we're having our first, uh, our first wheelchair, um, member who's actually going to be able to come down and use the range since we made it, uh, wheelchair accessible. Um, so there's a lot going on down there, uh, that we feel as though the town should know about, and we're really excited. We have a lot of clubs from Southern Maine actually come and view our range. So, uh, we really look at it as an asset to the town. And uh, we look forward to being able to provide this really unique experience um, to the town for the years going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And to Tammy's question, um, if you had anything else to add, you know, if we were in person, you could also come up to the microphone and speak. So you could have three minutes as well if there's something you, need, you needed to say. No, I'm, I'm all set. That was good. I, I thought I had something, but I figured I would just let Mark say it all. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, anyone else from the public wishing to comment on this item? All right. Um, so uh, we do have the report from the chief in the packet. The recommendation is to renew the license as presented. So the draft motion is uh, for the council to approve the three-year renewal of the license for the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club located at 1250 Sawyer Road as presented. Do I have a motion? So moved. Penny, thank so you. Moved. Second. Caitlin, second, thank you. Any discussion on this item? All in favor? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero, Madam Chair. Thank you.
Um, and now item 101-2020, uh, referral to the Conservation Committee relating to Cliff House Beach use and management of the Cliff House Beach. Um, is there anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Yes, Jesse Eaton, and please do um, identify your address for the record. Uh, yes, thank you uh, to the committee. Uh, Jesse Eaton, I'm a resident of 20 Glen Avenue here in Cape. I've been a Cape resident since 2013. Um, you know, this particular item uh, really, I think, grows out of the overflow issues, um, both here at the beach, as well as parking and traffic. Um, you know, a lot of the overflow, candidly, um, comes from other beaches based on sort of half occupancy and some management of other beaches that have uh, diminished capacity there. But since there are no control measures here in place at Cliff House Beach, um, we sort of get everyone coming this direction. Um, my concerns personally are with the, uh, the lack of posted speed limits, um, traffic rules, in addition to just basically wide open parking. There is no posted parking anywhere other than an overnight no parking. Um, this creates both traffic congestion, but also a lot of blind spots uh, for traffic circling around Glen and Seaview, which if you've never been down here, it's sort of a hairpin loop. Um, I have three kids, 12, 10, and 7. They attend Cape schools and candidly uh, do not feel comfortable letting my kids outside out in front of my house on very busy days. Um, this is both due to the vehicular traffic, which um, comes around the corner very fast, looks at the water, doesn't look where the cars are. Um, additionally, um, you have people circling repeatedly looking for parking. Um, again, moving at pretty high rate of speed. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's, there's, there's no mass ev eminent, uh, evident anywhere. Um, I think, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for all of my neighbors or the neighborhood, but, uh, and I think no one is against access to the beach, um, but the lack of any infrastructure has created um, unsafe conditions um, for residents and importantly, uh, children in this neighborhood. Um, I think one way to address this is to uh, uh, examine limiting uh, parking on Glen and Seaview to either Cape residents via the um, town permit. Um, or to, you know, as well as residents in the neighborhood um, and, you know, potentially have parking along Shore Road uh, for those that are visiting. Um, this would both limit the vehicular traffic on Glen and Seaview, um, as well as um, less pressure on the beach itself. Um, you know, we, we have pretty unsafe beach conditions down there when you have 115 people on a 50 by 200 beach. Um, if you haven't been down here, I'd invite the council down someday on a, on a hot day when it's low tide and uh, take a look. Um, but there's a lot going on down there um, and it needs to be addressed. I thank you uh, for your consideration and for the time. Thank you. And I, I will note that we did also receive some email correspondence about that, those concerns. Um, Christopher Campbell. Yes, hi. Um, I just want to thank the council for all of the hard work that went into uh, the dog issue a couple of years ago. And um, a lot of people in the town were very helpful in working through the process of creating some really responsible and reasonable uh, rules down at the beach. And so I thank you for that. And I also thank you for bringing the issue forward now regarding um, the, the second problem in the neighborhood, which of course has become that the beach is now um, a destination beach instead of a neighborhood beach. And uh, as Jesse just suggested, we're, we're not interested in keeping people from using the beach, uh, but the, um, the infrastructure has become very, very strained um, as more and more people flood to the access to the beach. So we look forward to um, a discussion through the committees and and figuring out a way, just as we did with the dogs, uh, to some reasonable approaches to um, alleviate the situation. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else from the public before we move on? Okay, seeing no one. Um, so there's no draft motion. Um, I imagine that 
I mean, it sounds like the concerns are, are traffic and parking um, at Cliff House Beach primarily. Um, Jamie, did you want to make a motion? Well, yeah, I, well, I was going to ask a question of Matt. Um, I wasn't, I, I know in, in some of the emails that we'd gotten, there was a request to engage the conservation committee. That's what the, the item is here uh, on the agenda, but it is, I, it, it's some of the concerns, I, I, I just didn't, didn't know if that was the right avenue um, to pursue the problem. You know, I mean, if, 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 uh, if it's matters of parking and things like that, that feels like it's outside of the scope of the conservation committee, but. Yeah, uh, if, if I may, Madam Chair, uh, respond to the question. Yeah, it's it's something that I wrestled with as well. Uh, but with the the conservation committee had a has had a good background in working uh, on that on that property in particular, uh, addressing the the larger issue of the dogs. Uh, you know, we're, we're in somewhat uh, different waters here right now with the pandemic, and we did get some signage down there to try to help out with social distancing and best practices. Uh, because they haven't been being followed and uh, did receive, uh, you know, we have received emails and there are concerns and they are legitimate uh, because there is, uh, as both uh, Jesse and Chris had uh, identified, there's, a, there's only a finite amount of square, square footage on the beach itself. And uh, you know, part of the challenge is I've been down there a few times over the past couple of weeks as well, following up on uh, the conversations. So there's a couple of large construction projects that are taking place in the neighborhood. Uh, so restricting parking has been, you know, how is that going to work very well with the uh, with the construction traffic that's there? So that that you know, to be frank, I don't think that helps uh, the access, uh, or at least the parking issue, one whatsoever. But uh, the work does need to be does need to be done. Uh, just thought that they, but the conservation committee may have the best opportunity to, to try to work through this. As far as I mean, I I don't think there's. There may be other areas that we can look at in talking with the chief. I know um, uh, Chief Fenton's been on. Uh, this as well tonight and we may be able to, we may uh, work on trying to come up with some interim ideas as well to help with that uh, as we had to after Fort Williams was uh, shut down and uh, try to get some emergency no parking areas uh, to try to help minimize that but uh, there are some other concerns there the, the looping through the neighborhood has been a is a, is a significant concern uh, so it may be a two-pronged approach where we look at it from a public safety standpoint from operationally here, but then at the same time, uh, there may be, you know, we may not be able to come up with a solution. We may have to come up with solutions in the short term, but they may want to look at, you know, there, you know, presumably there will be another summer uh, that comes up next year. So if we can get some uh, other plans in place as well to help us, you know, not just over the next two to three months, but also long-term as well uh, to come up with, Better recommendations. So, that but doesn't, doesn't the beach overcrowding? Well. Doesn't the beach overcrowding problem, which I think is is probably more of a short term consideration anyway, just based on on some of the points that were raised from the public comment. But I mean that also presumably is mitigated by any changes to the parking. It seems it seems like the parking is is sort of problem one. That, well, that, that some of the other things stem from that. So yeah, there is there is there's that. In it, but if you push the parking up to Shore Road, you're still going to have the same issue with people down on the beach if they're parking on Shore Road and just walking down because you do get there is a significant amount of foot traffic that goes there as well in the surrounding neighborhood. So it's, yeah, it's a question of how you know maybe that's where the conservation committee could look at that and say, okay, are you going to you know are you going to look at restricting the number of people who can be on that beach at one time? And if you do so, uh, the next question obviously comes up and how are you going to enforce that uh, when you do have it? Are we, are we going to hire, you know, an, uh, a person for the summertime to count, to count people? It, so it's, it's kind of a lot of questions, but not a lot of answers at this point, but it does need to be worked through. Jeremy? I was just going to pursue a couple of comments along the same line. Um, when this, when the the last time this was, the council referred this to the conservation committee. I was serving on that committee, um, and we had um, some substantial discussions with uh, Mr. Eaton and Mr. Campbell participated in those as well, as well as Chief Fenton, um, who was not chief at the time of. Um, 
and you know the the three big issues that came up then at that time were the dog use the, the overnight fires on the beach and and this issue around parking um, and the conservation the parking issues were just beyond the purview of the, the conservation committee to deal with so I did have that question of whether or not what if we decide to refer this to conservation and I, I don't have a problem doing that I think they they have a good background and, and can come up with some good recommendations for us and the, the neighbors um, are familiar with that process and um, but I would just want to make sure that we have um, either a council representative or someone there who's empowered to flag some of the issues that are may, may require more immediate council action uh, and and may go beyond management of the park issues. Um, I think there's a range of solutions that are available to us, uh, but I, I don't want to artificially restrict what's coming back by, by where we send this for a referral. Or delay it. <laughs> If, if, if I may, Madam Chair, uh, one additional item. You know, when we did uh, look at restricting parking in the areas surrounding the fort uh, dur during the time when it was closed, uh, you know, there, were good, there was good and bad that came to that, uh, came from that as well. We had residents who uh, were upset about the fact that we had no parking because uh, their kids were home from college and they, they generally would park on streets. So uh, you've got the trying to find a way to balance the needs of the residents and uh, I'm not sure if just using a, a Cape Elizabeth uh, transfer or recycling center sticker is the is the best way to uh, to look at that because uh, I don't know I think there may be there may be uh, solutions to it but I, uh, I I don't have them at this point in time it's a, you know it's a public beach it's a public street and uh, one solution may create a, diff a, a different problem. Uh, and I hate to say it like that, but uh, there is no there is no immediate silver bullet that that solves everything that's going on down there. Uh, we're trying. We get the signage up immediately last week. Once we learned about it, we had that up, and we have it up on the beach. Trying to have restrict traffic up and down the stairs at one party at a time. Uh, we do we do hope uh, that common sense prevails and people do follow best practices uh, for their own preservation uh, because there were concerns about. You know, two groups of people, one coming up, one going down at the same time. There's no way to maintain a six-foot difference uh, distance at that point in time. And if they're not wearing masks, then uh, they're not they're not following any of the best protocols. Uh, so we've tried to do that with signage at the top and the bottom of the stairs, as well as as they enter the enter the at least the beach area property. But the parking is the tough one uh, as far as as working on the solution for that. Chris, go ahead. I realize my view on parking in no way correlates to the major view of society. So I re feel free to completely reject it. Uh, but I, it always, uh, it always drives me bonkers that, um, I should, maybe that's an extreme way of putting it, but uh, it, it's, it's always befuddled me that uh, we have ceded large chunks of the public right of way to people to permanently park their vehicles on and turn into their private little, even though it's quasi private parking lot. Um, and I've always wondered why we even allow parking on the street uh, for extended periods of time and overnight and whatnot. But I would note that um, during the wintertime, uh, you can't park on the street overnight. So uh, we already do restrict parking during part of the year. Uh, I personally think that having uh, the Cape sticker would help. Uh, my firsthand experience with going and observing the be beach, it, and then this is just anecdotal, but then I went down and looked at Willard at the same time. And if you go to Willard, they have a parking lot we don't hear. And what I, will, what I saw when I went to Willard is that cars are now circling trying to get parking spots um, in the parking lot or otherwise uh, cruising up and down the, the nearby side streets that where you can, the limited spots where you can find parking looking for spots. And if you're in that situation where you just can't find a parking spot at Willard, you're like, oh, what am I gonna do? Oh, oh wait, there's that beach right down the way that has no restrictions on parking and you can park right at the top of the stairs. So my sense is, as some had noted, that what we're experiencing is the overflow pouring over there now uh, when we've reached the point where Willard in South Portland is uh, uh, at capacity for the parking. But I also, uh, I've been, I, I was going down the stairs myself after we got the various complaints. Um, and 
I was like seven or eight feet from the bottom of the stairs and a young gentleman, not wearing a mask or anything, just kind of looked up at me, saw me almost at the bottom of the stairs and just started heading straight up. <laughs> and those are narrow stairs. So it's, it, and I realize we're going to run into this everywhere. I go to the store, people aren't wearing masks, it drives, to, but I'm obviously on the extreme on my mask wearing and the purchase things, but I, it, it's a, both a COVID problem and then the parking problem. And um, how, that other street also, uh, it's a dead end at the end. There's no turnaround even. So if you have cars parked on both sides, not only is it incredibly narrow, so no one can really get through very well anyway, you're going down and the only place to turn around is basically in people's driveways down there. So there isn't even room to turn. So it's, it's a, it, it is a traffic congestion issue. So what do we do with this? Do we, do we the town council, try to figure this out or whatnot? But this is all rooted in a, uh, in a town park and the usage of the town park, which is why for me, it seems like, who do we send town park issues to? And it would be, well, Fort Williams, Fort Williams Park Commission, everything else conservation committee. So I would just send it to the conservation committee and say, you guys figure, come up, think about it, try to think out of the box, come up with some suggestions for us to deal with this. So I, I would just send it to the conservation committee. I recognize it's outside of the, just maintaining public trails and whatnot, but they seem like the ones best, um, uh, best uh, suited to handle this issue and give us some recommendations. So that would be my preferred approach. Uh, Chris, are you making a motion to refer this to the conservation committee? Um, I, I will, but I really, really would like wanted to hear from Jeremy because he knows way more on all of this than me. So like, if he said, no, 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 the conservation committee is not the place to go, I'd be like, okay, then no with the motion. But if he thinks it's a good, I basically, I'm going to defer to Jeremy on what he thinks is the direction we should go here. Um, so so Valerie thinking, has... I, I'd second that if that answers his question. Okay. Um, does that answer your question and are you making a motion? I, I move that we refer the issue to the Conservation Committee for consideration and suggestions. Um, specifically, what issue so uh, we can be clear? I move that we refer the issue of um, uh, the overutilization of uh, no, I don't want to say overutilization. I, I move that we refer the issue of uh, usage intensity at Cliff House Beach during the COVID crisis, along with uh, related parking issues to the Conservation Committee for recommendations. Jeremy, you're seconding that? Okay. Um, Valerie, you had your hand up, so I'll come to you first for discussion. Okay. Um, well, my concern is that um, it's overcrowded and it's due to, we've got COVID-19. That seems like it's part of our emergency orders and something that the council should take immediate action on. Uh, I've walked down to the beach at the begin, like in March and April, and it wasn't crowded then. I have not walked down lately. Um, and so I can only guess how crazy it is. I've seen the parking down there. Um, and I know how crazy it is. And I know Chief Fenton was on the call earlier. I, I'd really like to hear um, from Chief if he's been down there. Is, is it extremely crowded down there? Because if it is, it just sounds to me like that may be something that we as a council need to address as part of an emergency order rather than sending it off because um, people not wearing masks, so many people down there, that's not safe for the residents and the people that live around live in the area either so um maybe it's something we need to take action on paul yeah um yeah our officers have had an increased amount of calls down there from uh, frustrated neighbors um in the in the recent weeks i can start to monitor that a little bit more closely going forward we got a lot of areas of town where um things are congested just because there's a lot more people going out now um we're two Lights Road, there's different areas that we're, we're, we're experiencing this as well. Um, some of the people that you are seeing down there as well are indicating that they are finding about the place from a website that says some of the best hidden beaches that are publicly accessible. So a lot of the out-of-staters are, are coming in and they're, that's their destination. They've read somewhere online that that's where they'd like to be. And then once again, you lose that sense of community when people from outside are coming in, although it is legally accessible for them. Um, the accountability-wise and some of the issues, I think, kind of arise out of that as well. Uh, Jeremy? Lost my 
Okay, um, I just want to make sure I, I, I support sending this to Conservation Committee. I, I personally would like to see them come back with some out of the box recommendations um, and make sure that they're addressing parking. Sorry, I've got some background noise here. Um, parking and other things that might be going, uh, other potential solutions. Um, and if there are interim actions that we could be taking that might um, help with some of the congestion that we're seeing, um, maybe that don't even necessarily require council action. I, you know, I, I, I could, I think, for example, we could be looking at maybe taking um, some staff that is otherwise up at Fort Williams on days when there's a midday low tide and it's going to be a bright, clear, sunny day and just helping with sort of an ambassador function down there. I think that would go a long way. Um, but um, in, in the interim, but I, I think conservation, you know, as long as we're clear to them that, you know, listen to all of the issues and come back with your best thinking on this. Um, I think they'll, they'll do a good job. Chris? My out of the box suggestion for the long term, um, which may be a bad suggestion, I haven't thought, thought it through all the way, was uh, when we, uh, assuming that we eventually decommission the fire station at, um, next to the cookie jar and consolidate with South Portland. That's a big if, but if we do that, it seems like setting up a parking lot for both the local commercial businesses there uh, uh, in the, the BA zone, as well as a parking lot that would then be the parking lot for the, the beach. We could put it there. It's only a one and a half block walk. I don't see that as very far myself. That would be how I would solve it in the long run. That doesn't solve the problem in the short term. Valerie? Well, it just seems that there's a lot of towns and cities that have, um, that require local parking permits. So um, even in Portland, there's certain areas that may have like local parking permits. Would it be that difficult to use the Cape um, Recycling Center sticker and just during, right now during COVID say that, we'd, I know we'd have to put up signage, but say that you have to have a Cape parking sticker? I, or would that cause too many problems? Chief, do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's a, that's kind of a difficult process there. You're not sure who actually has the stickers, um, you know, who chooses to put stickers on their cars. There's a, there's a host of issues of just using that as the only factor in it that I see that could come down the pike. Um, you know, we're always down there monitoring. You could do the, I, I would go more with an emergency no parking and try to limit the numbers that way. I think that would be more effective and just across the board way. But once again, you are gonna run into some issues. Some locals are uh, upset about the parking, but some also on the other side, and I learned this, the hard way with Fort Williams, uh, anticipate and need that parking for college kids who are home or even family members who are home because of COVID. There's a lot more people that are home and need to park their vehicle somewhere. And sometimes that on-street access is where they are utilizing uh, those spaces for family members. So the frustration comes at both ends. Okay. Um, so we do have a motion and a second. Um, so there's no further discussion on that motion, um, then let's take a vote. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Uh, I'll come. I said, Yes. Oh, there you go. Thank you. I registered that one. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, Councillor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Thank you. And Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, all right. So at this point, we do have a few attendees left. Um, at this point, there is an opportunity to raise any topic not on the agenda that pertains to Cape Elizabeth local government. Please raise your hand if you would like to comment. I don't see any hands. Okay, uh, and that brings us to the end of our agenda this evening. So do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Jeremy, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any discussion before we vote? No, Matt, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yep. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Penny Jordan? Councilor Straw? Yes. And Chairman Adams? Yes. You stand adjourned, Madam Chair, at uh, the unanimous vote to adjourn at 7 to 0. Thank you. Good night. And please tell Deb that it, she has always had my utmost respect for the work she does. And really, the way she handles things in these meetings is amazing. So I'm sure she's busy tonight, but tell her thank you. We definitely shall, and uh, uh, I apologize for being the, uh, <laughs> the, sh the low man on the totem pole, so I hope I did you all right tonight as well. Oh, you were great, but, <laughs> but doesn't it make you really just appreciate Deb even more? <laughs> she makes my life easier every day, and I have been grateful for working with her for 20 years, so <laughs> thank you. Have a great night. Thanks, you too. <laughs> Thanks.